great. Good morning. My name is Rebecca Cohen. It's my pleasure to welcome you to FHFA and to our Federal Home Loan Bank and CDFI Symposium. Whether you're joining us in the room or participating virtually, we're so glad you're here. Uh, we look forward to a productive and enlightening day of discussion on how the banks, non-depository CDFIs, and FHFA can better work together to meet housing and community development needs in underserved communities. Before we get started, I just have a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, there will be opportunities for Q&A after each panel. If you're in the room and want to ask a question, just raise your hand. We'll have a couple mic runners who will come around and find you. Um, please be sure to identify yourself before asking. If you're joining on Zoom, just type your questions in the Q&A panel on the screen, and we'll keep an eye on that for you. Um, there are QR codes on the table for folks in the room you can use to access the agenda for the day. We have a tight timetable. Um, we may not get to some points. Our moderators may need to keep the conversation moving. We may not get to all the questions, but we'll do our very best. Um, and finally, I think everyone's favorite part, I have a legal disclaimer that we would like to share, um, which I will read to make sure I don't miss anything. So during today's session, FHFA will not discuss the status or timing of any potential rulemaking. If FHFA does decide to engage in a rulemaking on any matters discussed today, this meeting would not take the place of a public comment process. The rulemaking document would establish the public comment process and you would need to submit your comments, if any, in accordance with the submission instructions in that document. FHFA may summarize the feedback gathered at today's session in a future rulemaking document if we determine that a summary would be useful to explain the basis of a rulemaking. Anything said in this meeting, and that also includes reactions such as nodding or eye rolling, should not be construed as binding on or a final decision by the director of FHFA or FHFA staff. Any questions we may have are focused on understanding your views and do not indicate a policy or legal position. Um, today's symposium is being live streamed on our website and video recorded. FHFA may also prepare a transcript of today's session, which would include the names of all speakers, the organizations they represent, if any. The recording and any transcripts prepared will be posted on FHFA's website and YouTube channel, along with any materials being presented today or otherwise submitted in conjunction with the symposium. Okay, with that out of the way, it is now my pleasure to introduce our opening speaker for some opening comments, FHFA Director Sandra Thompson. Thank you, I will remember not to eye roll. Um, I am so happy to be here, good morning to everyone and thank you for joining us today. It is really great to see such a packed house and we have many more joining online. I know that all of the Federal Home Loan Bank presidents and staff are here, as well as many CDFI um, fund presidents and chairs and directors and organizations. And I really do just want to take the time to thank you all for making the time to come. We also have people from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac here. I want to acknowledge their presence. And I, in particular, want to acknowledge um, two people, uh, the head of the CDFI fund from Treasury, who came all the way across town in this heat to uh, be with us in person. And you'll be hearing from Praveena Raghavan right after I speak. And so we just want to welcome you to our building and thank you for taking the time out to come and speak on this very important topic. I also want to acknowledge FHFA staff who have been working diligently to make sure that we bring this together. I have been uh, very engaged in this uh, forum and just want to thank them and just express my appreciation and gratitude for all that they've done. But there's one person in the room that the people need to know, and that's Joshua Stallings, who's our deputy director for the home loan banks, and he's done an outstanding job. He went around the country for almost a year and a half, I think your third week on the job, and got lots of information that provided input to our Home Loan Bank at 100 report. Now, I do believe that all of us here today are committed to working together to better serve underserved communities across the country. Many of us live or work in these communities, and we see their needs firsthand every single day. We are in the middle of a housing affordability crisis 
which is exacerbated by a housing supply shortage. And those suffering the most are our most vulnerable populations. At FHFA, we're looking closely to identify every single opportunity for our regulated entities to address urgent housing affordability needs while continuing to ensure safety and soundness. The home loan banks and CDFIs are natural partners in addressing these challenges, which can be found in cities, suburbs, rural areas, and tribal communities in every state and community across this nation. The home loan banks have a liquidity mission and they also have a responsibility to support housing and community development in the communities within their districts. And CDFIs have the relationships and on the ground expertise to work in these areas that are typically not served by other financial institutions and with borrowers who often don't have access to traditional financial products and services. We're very pleased to host today's symposium and we hope that this will provide an opportunity for the home loan banks and CDFIs to build a greater understanding and appreciation of each other's business models and capabilities, and most importantly, figure out ways to better work together. We have leadership from each of the 11 home loan banks with us today, either in the room or online, as well as, again, the expertise from CDFIs across this country. And I'm pleased to also welcome our colleagues from the Treasury CDFI Fund, who play an important role in certifying and supporting CDFIs. Certainly while there's been tremendous growth in the number of certified CDFIs in recent years, only 71 non-depository CDFIs are members of the home loan bank system. This is a much higher number than it was when I started at FHFA in 2013. The number was 11 and I won't ever forget it, but there certainly is room for further growth. Of those 71 member institutions, fewer than half have outstanding advances from their federal home loan bank. The ability to access low cost liquidity through advances is one of the most important benefits of becoming a member of the system. Members, including CDFIs, can turn around and use that financing to support projects in their communities that might not otherwise be able to be obtained or get funding from different sources. As I noted earlier, we're in the middle of a housing crisis. People can't afford to live where they work. Young people are returning home after college to stay with their parents, or they're having four or five roommates. There simply isn't enough supply to meet the demand for affordable housing and apartments. As the CDFI industry matures and more and more non-depository CDFIs meet the requirements to become home loan bank members, we have a real opportunity to make a difference. CDFIs are aware of the needs in the communities in which they work, and they have a relationship-based approach that allows them to work effectively with different types of borrowers. The banks have the flexibility and local reach in their respective districts to partner with CDFIs to help support this work. I do want to acknowledge the hard work and ongoing efforts by many CDFIs to engage with the home loan banks to identify and overcome issues that have prevented them from fully benefiting from the membership in the system. The insights and feedback provided by these CDFIs has been extremely helpful to us as we begin implementing recommendations in the System 100 report. FHFA staff will provide an update later today on the System at 100 implementation and will continue to seek your input as we develop guidance and begin rulemaking on these and other issues. I also want to recognize steps taken by the home loan banks to identify innovative ways to work with CDFIs. You'll hear about some of these programs later today. And while I know that the work isn't always easy, I'm hopeful that with the willingness of both CDFIs and the banks to make a difference in our communities, that we will have a productive conversation. I'm really looking forward to a constructive day, and I'd like to come away with something concrete. This time next year, I would expect to see demonstrated progress between CDFIs and the home loan banks. Our nation is experiencing a housing crisis, 
and it's time for all of us to step up. The home loan banks always step up during the middle of a crisis. Primarily, it's a liquidity crisis. This time, it's a housing crisis. It's time to exercise our authorities with the other side of the mission. So I'm just hopeful that in the discussions that take place today and in the weeks and months to follow, I'm encouraging everyone to continue engaging with, you, with each other, thinking about the possibilities and finding ways to make this partnership work to address unmet needs. Thank you again for traveling um, and being here today to participate in this discussion. And I'm hoping that there is some tangible outcomes and output from this discussion because we have these meetings all the time and I really wanna hear about progress and progress can be measured and wanna make sure that we have a good meeting but that it results in something that is tangible. So thank you very much and have a wonderful conference. Thank you, Director. Um, so to save time throughout the day, we generally will not be reading through our amazing speakers' uh, credentials before each session. However, we have compiled speaker profiles on our public engagements webpage, and I encourage you to take a look to learn more, including about our next presenter, the Director of Treasury's CDFI Fund. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Praveena Raghavan. Um, that's good because I have a really long bio, so it just saves time. <laughs> that's actually what I use for most of my 30 minutes. Um, but anyway, I want to thank Rebecca, and I also want to thank the director, uh, Director Thompson, for inviting me to the CDFI symposium. I agree with her. This is a very important discussion to learn from each other and understand how we can help each other, uh, really help communities. Uh, that and I, uh, I am. I moved from New York to Maryland and I actually went and looked at my sister who we bought together and said, you know, we can't afford a house in Maryland and we both are federal employees. So just put that there that you had two people moving from Brooklyn, New York, which is not cheap in itself and yet we couldn't find a home here in Maryland uh, where I am because of just the housing crisis. And you think, I have an adequate amount of capital. How do we help those who really can't even say that to somebody and come and uh, make a difference? So I'm looking forward to talking with you guys today, giving you, my job here today is to kind of give you a one-on-one on, -one on uh, what the CDFIs are, because uh, the CDFIs in the room know, but other people may not. And so just to make sure that you understand what we do at the CDFI Fund, how we can partner with you, and I agree with Director Thompson, let's get some real outcomes, uh, because I think it's great when you have these symposiums, it gives great ideas, but then how do we make sure that we're going through, both from a policy perspective, but also an interaction and developing partnerships. Um, and I also want to commend the efforts of FHFA um, and the network of the federal home loan banks uh, to explore new ways that FHLB can uh, serve the capital as a capital source for CDFIs. Uh, for example, in your FHFA 100 reports issue last year, there are a number of recommendations on how FHLB can expand its activities, not only to non-depositor CDFIs, which I know we have in the room, which are extremely mission focused, and certain credit union members with a total pledge to a wider range of eligible collateral and to secure the advances, which are very critical um, and support the housing mission that we all have. So we really are looking forward to partnering with all of you on it. Let's see if I can make this work. This is when we find out. Nope. Okay, next slide, please. See, this is when we, <laughs> oh, it's a big green button. All right, got it. <laughs> They're looking at her going, shit. So uh, just a little bit what I'm going to talk about, just give you a quick overview um, to un help understand what is a CDFI, what are our programs that we actually run the CDFI fund, and then our program impact. I just want to make sure there's the CDFI fund, and then there are CDFIs. A lot of times people think we are the CDFIs. We are not. We are the fund that helps uh, certify and then validate them and then also provide uh, capital to them. So uh, just making that extension. Um, to make sure, so I'm gonna go, let's see if this works. So our mission, so our mission is, you know, very audacious. Our mission is to un promote availability and affordability of capital and credit into distressed and underserved communities. And it really, when I talk about these communities, we're talking about communities that are in need both in rural and metro areas, but have no way of accessing capital. And that means they don't not even have a bank in their neighborhood, they don't know how to get even start on the financial ladder and what these CDFIs do is go into those communities, create relationships and help them grow. But as you probably know, it's not just the CDFIs, it's also other partners and that's actually um, from my work when I was at the state of New York, we partnered with CDFIs, we've partnered with foundations, we partnered with a lot of people to help these communities. It's not a one-time shot. 
push in equity, but it is about creating a balanced approach to getting for them all to be financial wealth. And so I always say we have a very audacious goal. And at the fund, our vision is really to make sure that we help all people and communities to access that, being able to give them access quickly. And even if that's something from financial counseling um, to a loan fund, we even have private equities, uh, venture capitalists, bond guarantees. We do a lot of programs to actually support different CDFIs to ha actually meet the people where they are as they grow. Um, let's see. Hey, I'm getting good at this. All right, there we go. Um, <laughs> uh, so we operate a number of programs, um, and this will tell you all, we're gonna get to the slide with the program. So we operate a number of programs uh, to help assist uh, mission base. These also include grants, tax credits, as well as bond guarantees. Um, and in total, uh, we have, this is actually a typo on this list, um, we've awarded over $7.5 billion in grant awards to organizations, as well as 76 a million dollars in tax credits through our new market tax credit program, and then only guaranteed almost $2.5 billion um, in bond issuances. Like I said, we have very different programs to hit different needs uh, to make sure. So the first question I always get is, what is a CDFI? Or what exactly do you guys do? So the CDFI fund, these are all legislation that affect us, um, and we work upon them. And you'll see one says Housing and Recovery Act, uh, but the one that we use as our statute that gives us the ability to help is the Regal Act. Um, and that is where we actually, uh, that's where actually tells exactly what we need to do for each of our programs. So um, as I said, these are com uh, community-based organizations focused on expanding economic opportunity to low-income communities. That's basically what they are. Um, and they're, they share a common goal of facilitating economic opportunities by actually working within the community in various places, such as housing, consumer loans, small business loans, um, and uh, bond equity and guarantee, and building up the community that they're in. They um, help families finance their homes, support small businesses, and then rebuild um, credit histories, which is really important, and then also invest in local health education and community facilities, and that's something that's interesting. So a community facility that can actually help the further neighborhood and not just the affordable housing area. And they are compromised of a mix of set, uh, oh, they're compromised of a mix of institutions, um, including loan funds, credit unions, and banks. So what does the CDFI fund do? <laughs> so we help uh, certify CDFIs. They have to be certified to be able to access. Um, and that responsibility is between our authorizing statute that allows us uh, criteria that is really well laid out about what you have to do to become a certified entity. So why do CDFIs become certified? One of the reasons is it's a gateway in access to the treasury program, our fund. But also in the past years, we've seen an increase in certifi certification CDFIs because it also opens participation in other federal and state programs, um, as well as gaining access to corporate and uh, philanthropic, philanthropic, I don't know why they write this in my, I can never say this, philanthropy <laughs> funding. Uh, and some agencies such as the CFPB have also provided regulatory waivers to certified CDFIs and of course membership of to the FLH, uh, Federal Home Loan Bank is also another benefit of a certified certification. Um, just so you know, on an annual basis, we validate all C certified CDFI fund, uh, certified CDFIs to make sure that they continue to meet um, certifications. I want to point out we are not a regulator in the sense of prudential regulators and oversee that oversee banks and credit unions. We validate the in information that is provided by us uh, to to any organization that voluntarily chooses to become a CDFI uh, to meet, make sure they in, meet the thresholds of what they need to do from a community base, um, as well as the track record on their financial services, to make sure that they really are providing services to the distressed communities. And the reason I bring that up is we validate what they tell us. It's not that we go in and um, do a, a significant audit as some of the other auditing and regulators. So, but we do work with them. And one of the interesting things is uh, with our new certification process, we're getting all their transactional level data. So that is one of the things they need to report to us to ensure that they are really doing what they're saying they're doing. Um, and all the CDFIs in the room, I'm just gonna warn you, I am not taking any questions on certification, okay? The rest of you who don't know what that means, don't worry, you're walking. Um, <laughs> so last year, uh, the CDFI fund revises, we revised our certification application. It's the first time we revised that application since its inception in 1994. And really what it was is to provide us greater data 
on um, understanding what a CDFI does on their transactional level, but also making sure to promote community development, support the growth that CDFIs have reached, um, especially when it comes to their ability to innovate and use new services and technology. Um, also foster a greater diversity, both in geography and types of activity that they do, and minimize the burdens on CDFI while data quality and collection methods. They'll say we didn't do it, but I believe we did. And facilitate <laughs> CDFI fund efficiency, uh, just understanding certification. So all the CDFIs are gonna be going into a sort of recertification process uh, starting this fall. Um, well, some have already started. And uh, that means that we are re-looking at everything and then they get, re they get validated every year as long as they continue to uh, hit their mission in their critical sectors, they continue to be certified. Um, so, Let's see if, aha, there we go, it worked. Okay, so these are several of the criteria to become uh, certified. Um, they must demonstrate this annually. So if you can look at it, it has to obviously be a legal entity, has mission, um, primary mission of promoting community development, be a financing entity, they must become financing, they do financing, maintain accountability. Our target markets are the areas that they look to, uh, to push in their money and fund. Um, and th this, is the, this is what we do and this is what we look at and this is how we make sure that they are continuing to work where they're supposed to, where they've told us they will. This is a really small slide, but just to tell you, there are four types of CDFIs that we have, so not all CDFIs are created equally. Um, they're banks, and then there are thrift and bank holding companies, credit unions, loan funds, and community development venture capital firms. So as you can imagine, each of them have different purposes and different uh, activities that they provide for the community. There are currently more than 1,400 CDFIs uh, with, with the largest single bot comprised of loan funds, 564. And the second largest is uh, the credit unions, which has been increased um, almost from 20, from how, from the December 2020, they went from 12, which is funny, to five, they have 500 currently, so they're at 55%. So they've been growing. So they're almost neck and neck with our loan funds. And as you can see, I always laugh, our venture capital funds stick in there at 1%. They're the smallest that we have in, in, um, in our area. And these are the types of lines of businesses that they do. Um, as you can see from, as I said, business, commercial real estate, uh, consumer finance. Uh, the largest among the funds is actually, we have microfinance is actually our substantial higher um, loan product. A lot of them offer that, which are small loans to get, get you credit and then start building up. And then uh, consumer loans, consumer financing is our lowest but they do a wide range um, in there. And CDFIs, just so you know, assets equal roughly 300 billion. So at the end of 1997, 196 certified CDFIs had 4 billion. So we've obviously increased, it is you know, a big increase. But when you look at the, they pale in comparison to the roughly $26 trillion in assets that are held by FDIC and NCUA insured organizations. So we're still growing, we're small but mighty, but they are growing in significance. This is asset type, there you go. I just, all right. So this is where we are, I, this is the heat map, and you can see there's disparity. Uh, a lot on the east, little thing, but there are 400 and they serve more communities. So this is where they're headquartered, that doesn't necessarily mean that's the area they serve. Um, and they're in all over the country, uh, both rural, native communities, um, in Guam, Colombia, uh, Puerto Rico, the District of Columbia, uh, and uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands. So we have them everywhere um, to make sure, but just this is where they're headquartered. We're looking to bring, to look at, they're close to reaching 1,500, and let me just give you an idea. When the fund started, there was about 808, and now we're at 1,500. So we have doubled in the amount of CDFIs, which means the activities in there. It also shows the need for them in the communities that they serve. Um, there's a reason they exist, is to get to people who normally don't have good relationships or any relationships with banks or any financial institution, and the thing they most know is the payday lender on the corner. My favorite. So, what do CDFIs do, and how do they do it? Um, so. The CDFI fund, I've talked a lot about the CDFIs. CDFI fund, we provide uh, financing, as I said, balance sheet capital to CDFIs through our program. Um, and the way it is, you get certified, you come through, uh, and then we look to see what your impact is gonna be. <coughs> Excuse me. The monetary rewards are provided by our program build the capacity for the CDFIs. That's really what it's meant to, is to ensure that they have the ability to grow and achieve their uh, achieve organizational sustainability. We do it, our biggest program is the CDFI program, 
named after the CDFI fund, um, and we provide financial assistance, which is usually financial products like loan loss reserves, capital reserves, financial services and development services. We also do technical assistance, which is used to actually help the capacity of the organization so they can develop things such as um, hiring people, new tech, new services, to make sure that they can be sustainable in the long run. And then we, they, the CDFIs utilize these grants to leverage their investments from a variety of public private sector partners. So those again include a mix of financial partners, both the foundations, governments, community stakeholders, and then doing that, forming a partnership with community-based groups to get both the clients, but also to build the community itself. And then they deploy these in different places like loans, um, mostly loans, and, and to look at making, accessing the needs of the community. So in addition to our one CDFI program, because everybody knows that one, we have other programs. Um, and that the CDFI, this, the traditional CDFI program is our anchor program, but these are the other ones that we provide. I'm just gonna highlight a couple because of the audience that we have here today. The Bank Enterprise Award Program is open to all CDFIs, open to all FDI insured depositors. So you don't have to be a CDFI. However, if you are a CDF certified CDFI, you, get, uh, you can have an additional larger grant amount. Um, and it really is helping to make sure that more um, more loans are given to CDFIs, and that's the point of the bank enterprise. So we give you money to give them more money uh, and to create more stability and access to capital for the CDFIs. Uh, the Capital Magnet Fund, uh, which is, we call is our premier flagship affordable housing program. We have one affordable housing program, so that's the joke. Um, and receives its fundi, funding, funding through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, is open to both CDFIs and nonprofits. It also does um, gives uh, loans and capacity to to do affordable housing and community development. We have the New Market Tax Credit Program. Uh, it's open to all, it's open to specific types of financial media, intermediaries known as community development entities. Um, I just wanna say those are different from CDFIs. They are, CDFIs can be CDs, but it's a different certification process. But they are actually tax credits that go in that are then bought by the investors to do a project. Um, it's a, and it's one of the most, it's a very healthy program. I will say that uh, my time at New York State, it's where we did a lot of our affordable housing initiatives. We coupled state money with federal money and then used investors to be able to use those tax credits, which actually you can put in a facility that you wouldn't have been able to do uh, because people don't wanna go into those neighborhoods, but we can encourage them. So it's a very well used program and really interesting when you're looking at some of the housing shortages that we have currently going on. And just, I wouldn't be a government official if I didn't show you the cumulative impact of my programs. Um, yeah, the thank you for those who laugh. Thank you, you got my, <laughs> everyone's like, should we laugh? Uh, these, are, these are the impact, and the reason I show this is there's still demand, there's a need. Um, most every round of funding we have, we have between three to five times more demand than we have supply. Um, which shows you that these communities still need the need and how can we help them. And that's actually what we do with the CDFI fund. You know, our appropriations have grown steadily from two to 300 uh, million over the last few years, um, but that's not enough. So that's what we have to look at partnerships. Um, part of our thing is, I know, as you, probably as all of you in this room, it's very interesting to see to see how the federal budget goes, but how do we then take that federal money and then capitalize it and leverage with other resources? And this just shows you all the impacts of our program. If you remember the first map, it was kind of, but this is all the different programs we have and how they've impacted these communities across the state. My favorite is you, some of them you can actually outline the state because of how much those CDFIs have gone in and really helped those communities. So. We have a 30-year history at CDFI. Uh, we're proud of it, but there's still so much more work to be done, and the gaps still exist. Uh, they're gonna exist. There are many places beyond even the reach of the CDFIs in our network, and how do you reach them? And that's what we really wanna find out from you is how can we partner uh, more so that we can actually reach these communities and get more capital into these CDFIs that actually know and people trust and allow them to build. So um, that's my 101 speech, and I'm happy to take questions because I. If there are some, except for certification questions, I will not take any. Um, you can ask, but I won't take them. Yeah. Director Thompson's looking at me like, wow, she's very strange. <laughs> but I'm gonna say, Rebecca, they are? Yeah, I, yes, we will make sure they are. Yes, they're public, we're happy to send them out. We'll, you guys got them. Oh, I'm gonna go back. <laughs> but if there are any questions, either online or in the room, and if not, it was a pleasure meeting all of you, and I can't wait to see more of what we can do together. Okay. There, 
There is a question from online. Okay. Um, it's from an anonymous attendee. It says, do you provide funding for tech startups solving issues for CDFIs? So CDFIs do. The CDFI fund itself does not, but one of the things is, yes, if you apply to the CDFIs and they are on our, we have them all listed on our website, um, look at their products. They do definitely provide uh, funding for tech startups. It will be in the form of a loan, uh, but we also have the venture capital um, CDFI funds that might actually look if you want to do the pitch deck and things like that. There are two questions here, but I know they're mic runners, so I'm going to wait. Good morning, uh, Tony Lopez from Russell Development Fund uh, in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, are you looking to, in the future, expand the capital magnet fund so that it can be used with other programs in, in conjunction with other programs or in conjunction with other uh, uh, CDFIs that have capital magnet fund funds in, in, uh, in the same project? Oh, you mean where are we going to match our own money? No, 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 <laughs> no, no not that. I mean, yep. but uh, it, it helps some of these programs, especially when you're talking about projects that are uh, fifty percent of AMI and below, mm -hmm. uh, to be able to uh, add different. Uh, and those projects tend to be uh, hard to find, and it helps to be able to uh, work with other CDFIs and coming to a larger project and being able to Got uh, mean a consortium. to put money into into those projects. Yeah, um, so we are hopefully in the next few days going to, we had comment, public comment on our CMF reg uh, that was uh, out, so thank you if anyone in this room put comment, we did review them. We're uh, close to announcing the new reg, which would allow consortiums in, in place, but yes, we, are, we have looked at some of the comments that came back and that was one that we've been looking at. Hi, I'm Kara Ward from Falcon Capital Advisors, and I have a question about Federal Home Loan Bank membership for CDFIs. I think a lot about residential mortgage finance, and as you are engaging in discussion with the Federal Home Loan Banks and FHFA, what's on your dance card for the top topics that you'd like to be able to work out with them on what makes it easier for CDFIs to get in the door? Whatever Director Thompson tells me. Um, but no. Uh, um, <laughs> she's like, no, anyway. Uh, actually, I think you, you brought up a good point, collateral, right? I think it's, it is one of the things we want to talk about uh, to see how we can how we can make it. Look, you can, you're certified. You get on there. And I think she, uh, the, the statistics speak for themselves, right? 11 to 61, that's great. But I have over 1,400. So you know, that's, that's not a large and only half. So let's try to figure out why. And I think that's part of what we're going on a listening tour to listen, um, to understand, and then see if we can come to a solution, knowing that both of us have structures and regulations that cannot be, that seem immutable, um, but are there other pathways for us to sit there and come to an area where we can increase that um, and make sure, because it is an important part. It's a, it's a very easy source of capital. It's an affordable port, part to put into some of these projects. So how do we get there? There is another question from yes. online. Um, an, an, another anonymous attendee asks, how does the fund target areas for investment where there have been a lack of CDFIs and investment? So it actually, so it's very hard. We don't target areas. We actually, like I said, it's voluntary for CDFIs to come in and tell us where they want to go. Uh, we encourage, uh, we do not, we can't create a CDFI. So we encourage to ask CDFIs to look at outside their target areas with the certification program. We're hoping to also get more CDFIs who have not been certified before to look into those. Um, and that's how we target it really. But our money is, has to go to a certified CDFI. Pravina, it's uh, Sanjay Basin, FHLB Dallas. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want to take two challenges that home loan banks have and with CDFI borrowing. Uh, the first one is with haircuts and what the gap is. So the bond guarantee program that the CDFI fund has, uh, would the CDFI fund be open to expanding that to include the gap that is there due to haircuts for that bond guarantee fund to apply on borrowing? And you don't have to. Yeah, I can't answer on that right now, but yes, understood, but yes. <laughs> it's something of a consideration that would the CDFI fund have. Uh, and the second question is on data mm -hmm. and the AMI system that is there. What is the plan for, can that act as a central source? Like, for example, for banks, all call reports go into FDIC. We use that data to then download the information and all. And the current system, the way it works is it's got its own stresses and how we get information and how information is provided. But you are collecting vast amount of data. Uh, but it would be helpful to know what the plan is on the data data front and how easily it will be available. 
Yeah. On the first point, um, again, we also have strict structure around our bond guarantee program, so we might need to work and see how we could do that. But um, take the note. I will take the note. Uh, and then on the data, we're actually trying to figure out the data architecture. So, I mean, we will have a lot of data, but it cannot be public. So how do you share data like that? Um, what data sharing agreements can we have? What can we release? And so we're working through that. It'll be the first time that we have records from transactional level records from all 1,500 of our CDFI. So this is a new front for us too. We're working on that right now, knowing that we're gonna have data, can we start showing it publicly aggregated? How, who can be allowed to see the system? Because obviously we're a federal system, uh, we need to keep that protected. So we are working through those issues right now to see how can we make it so that we can create a, at least a base form or a foundation for looking at what the CDFI industry does. I saw another hand, but maybe it was just, no, okay. As they think, I have a few more questions from sure. online. Um, do CDFIs have any special privileges in the state small business credit initiative? <laughs> uh, it'll depend on the state, actually. Uh, so the state small credit credit initiative is also run out of Treasury. As a, it was a ten billion dollar program uh, provided. So every state had to put in an application on how they were going to use the money. One of the biggest ones that was was, was revolving loan funds. Uh, some states have involved their CDFIs because that was the easiest way to get out to the market. Uh, but it is state by state dependent, and you can find out what everybody, every state plan is and where they've signed up on the SSBCI website. It will give you that information. And I would encourage, if you're a CDFI, go and talk to your state. Uh, they're still trying to deploy their money, so they are very be they're behind. They're st get, starting to get their second tranches out, so there's still time. And another one. Uh, what conversation has the CDFI fund staff had with banking regulators about the implementation of the revised Community Reinvestment Act? How does the litigation that has stopped the new CRA rule from taking effect affect CDFIs receiving investments? Well, I mean, CDFIs have received investments before. I don't think that'll stop it. Um, it'll continue on. We do talk to the regulators. Uh, we, you know, uh, they they have a job to do. We only give them information based on what we see in the industry and what we think would help. Uh, one of the things we've been promoting, obviously, is to ensure that they realize CDFIs. Every bank examiner is different. Uh, that CDFIs are, you know, a really good investment for the bank and really do apply to the CRA because it is all they do. That is their primary mission. So we continue to talk to them to make it. It would have been good for the CRA to go through because it wrote it right in there. But we're working on that. Who are VC CDFI funds, and where can we find them? Who are the, where are the CDFIs? Is that what you're asking? BC Venture Capital. Oh, it's on our website. Okay. Yeah. And then one the more. CDFIfund.gov. <laughs> Thank you. And one more. How can a tech startup handling this kind of data reach out to the agency? Uh, you can write us at CDFIfund.gov. I just want to also make a, uh, this is contracting, so I, I don't have my, I, I like the eye rolling of the official one, but all contracts are, you know, publicly put out on a, uh, are, are uh, on GSA, so we don't, you know, we can take a meeting, but I will say this, if you take a meeting and your solution is it, then you're out, uh, because when we contract, we have to make sure we're very fair, so happy to learn about what you're doing, but uh, just realize if you want a contracting opportunity, we've got to go through the federal contracting process. Any more questions? All right, well, you've been a lovely audience. Most of my other audiences laugh a lot, so I'll work on it for next time. But, right, thank you. Thank you, and now I'll welcome up our first panel for the day on the Federal Home Loan Bank Membership Value Proposition. I want to come on up. Oh, good morning. Uh, we're here today to talk about the Federal Home Loan Bank and CEFI value proposition, and also about the challenges. Um, it's an introductory. We won't get to everything. Um, we might touch on collateral, but we'll have a separate session on collateral in the afternoon. Uh, we have Matt from NeighborWorks Capital, um, David from Wisconsin Native Loan Fund, and Mary Beth from the um, Federal Home Loan Bank of Indianapolis. So we have about 45, I'm sorry, 40 minutes for discussion, leaving 10 minutes for questions. 
So uh, I think we should start with the membership value proposition from both the Federal Home Loan Bank and the CDFI perspective, and then reserve the rest of the time to talk about the challenges. Um, so we start with from the Federal Home Loan Bank side. Um, what's the value proposition for having CDFIs join as members, non-depository CDF CDFIs in particular? Yes, from the Federal Home Loan Bank perspective, having the opportunity to partner with CDFIs as members just broadens the way that we can partner with these financial institutions. So prior to CDFIs being eligible for Federal Home Loan Bank membership, we were partnering with you all as sponsors on competitive HP developments or you're using our home ownership set-aside grants. And this gives us a broader way that we can now partner. You can be a recipient of those grants. You can come to a competitive HP application as the member, supporting another developer. This broadens the, the ways that we can participate. And we've found the, the participation with CDFIs and the comments that have been made in the introductory remarks about the unique perspective that you all have as a financial institution, uh, but the, the grassroots, you know, boots on the ground knowledge of what is going on in the community. And the most recent example for us was when we were looking in, in late 2019, or late 2018, going to 2019, on our investment in Detroit, which is the largest metropolitan city in our district. We knew there's certainly need in the city. We know there are people that are doing work in the community. So we did not have our grant dollars going to the city. And our CEO, Cindy Coney, said, how do we learn what's going on in Detroit? And I said, we need to go there and listen to people that know what's going on. And the people that we met with were, the organizations were CDFIs. And it, we said it's not about membership. It was not necessarily our members. Sometimes they're members of other federal home loan banks or prospective members. And we said it's, it's not about membership. It's about you know what's going on. And uh, we learned a lot. And ultimately, we learned it was not any challenges with our programs, but rather that we were not physically in the city. And that led to opening our Detroit hub. And, uh, and again, CDFIs were, were a big part of that and uh, a part of our, our education and our learning. So I think we should hear from the members about the value proposition, too. Great. Is there anything either of you would like to say about um, commenting on Mary Beth with the education and getting to know this CDFIs? Well, yeah, the, um, for us joining, you know, the, like you said, the education piece is a big piece for us. We, as a non-depository bank, or not bank, we're not obviously a bank, but we when we came into the process, understanding some of the terminology, understanding some of the processes that um, we have to go through, um, onboarding, learning some of the terminology, so there was definitely a, a learning curve for us. We are, my particular organization is a well-established, we've been around since 2007, but I'd say we're on the small to medium size of a CDFI, we're about a $10 million portfolio, we're about ready to break that barrier and go way past. Um, but it's definitely the onboarding process and, and learning about the Federal Home Loan Bank system and some of the, uh, <clears throat> some of the requirements, especially as a non-regulated um, agency. You know, we've got to follow different rules. We've got to start following into some of the rules that the banks do have to follow that we haven't previously had to follow. We also have some record keeping and, and changes that we have to, um, accommodate for becoming a member. And I think you also mentioned some of these timelines. You know, if you were to wait to make those adjustments when you really needed the money, it, it would take too long. So it's important to learn these things well before you're applying for membership. Right? Def definitely. Um, you know, we're, we're a pretty rapid changing organization, but it's the the process did take some time to do and the timelines for us it was the like when federal home loan bank of chicago came to us and they said well we need this in the next 10 days or the next 15 days some of those things were hard for us to do because one we had to learn the other part was that our technology may have not been set up for that so again like i said making record keeping changes was so like we don't record currently we record all of our mortgages and things like that but we may do a debt consolidation loan that is mortgage backed versus a home loan that's mortgage backed we record that as a debt consolidation loan and a mortgage loan or a home loan 
we do not necessarily record it as a mortgage-backed loan versus a non-mortgage-backed loan. So we've got to go through and update our system so that we can, rec um, we can record those kind of things so that we can get the reports that the federal home loan bank system needs reported on a, I think it's a quarterly basis that we have to report those out. So there's definitely some changes that we need to make and some of those are gonna take a little bit of time to implement and in the meantime, we've got to do it manually and so it's, it takes some work to do. Great, thanks. And Matt, we can, you probably have a slightly different perspective from being a member for a while. Sure, uh, thanks. Um, so thank you for having us today and uh, thank you to uh, Director Thompson for uh, having uh, the, the venue for, for this uh, discussion today. Um, so we, we are the newest member, CDFI member in the Atlanta Bank. We joined in, in February. Our process for joining was actually fairly smooth. We, we are incorporated in Colorado, so we had to change our uh, designation of uh, principal business. But once we applied in, in November, we got the approval in January and uh, be, became a member in, uh, in February. Uh, in, in terms of the uh, value proposition for us, um, so, so I thought this might come up, so I, uh, I uh, wrote down a couple of notes. So one was, um, you have to be a member to submit AHP applications. So we uh, serve the 247 nonprofits in the NeighborWorks network, and they historically had to go to financial institutions. Uh, since we joined, we had a number of them actually call us up and say, hey, can you submit AHP applications on our behalf? So, so that's something that we can do as a member, but not, not from outside of the, the system. Um, I know there will be a lot of conversation uh, later today on advances and collateral, so I'm not going to go in that too much. We, we do have some challenges as a CDFI with, with our collateral, the springing lean, the, the haircuts, but I know uh, my, my friends will, will cover that in, in a later panel. But it, it, it is a stable and reliable source. It's competitively priced. I just learned in Atlanta the spread that they get on the advances is 14 to 8, 18 basis points, which is not, not, uh, not very high. Um, uh, there are also some other benefits that we didn't, didn't know of prior to joining. For example, we can park our idle cash uh, with the Federal Home Loan Bank in Atlanta, and we earn over 5.2% on our idle cash, which is much more than if we were to park it in a uh, normal FDIC-insured bank account. Um, there's also an ability to do guarantees and credit wrap um, certain facilities. So this will likely be less useful for us because we are S&P rated as an A+. So the additional benefit of credit wrapping something with the FHLB's credit rating is less likely, but it's good to have ju just in case. Um, we also wanted to be part of the system. Um, so if uh, if we wouldn't join, or if we would not have joined, we would not have had the opportunity to be part of this discussion today. Or just last week, the Atlanta Bank hosted a annual member meeting, and five of our CDFIs had lunch with, the, with Atlanta's executives team, including the CEO, CFO, chief legal officer, and, and it gave, gave us an opportunity to be at the table. Um, so, so we wanted to be part of the solution uh, rather than uh, just talking about challenges and, and issues from the outside. Um, the, being part of the Federal Home Loan Bank also has a marketing uh, value for us and a, a stamp of approval. So we had to meet four financial ratios uh, to be able to join the Federal Home Loan Bank and the Atlanta Bank they review our financials quarterly. Uh, I actually want to give a shout out to the Atlanta Bank because with all of our investors, we have to provide quarterly reporting to them. The Atlanta Bank just takes it from Ares. So sometimes I wonder if they actually get our reporting. We, we don't have to do anything, it just happens. Uh, and, and I wish all of our investors would just get, get, get our reporting. So um, yeah, we're, we're, we're excited to uh, to be able to take advantage of advances. Uh, I just wanted to uh, touch on may maybe two challenges we've had. One was 
um, a, a springing lean concept. So, so we're looking at um, uh, potentially setting up a subsidiary with a joinder agreement to kind of ring fence uh, the assets that, that we pledge to, to get around uh, this issue. And then secondly, um, so we're currently capped at uh, advancing 10% of our total assets. We could increase that to 20% once we start using the, the, the facility. Um, I know each bank does it a little, little bit differently. The one nice thing about this is most of our investors give us a $10 million line or a $20 million line, but it doesn't scale with your balance sheet as your balance sheet goes. But uh, with the Atlanta Federal Home Loan Bank, uh, that 10% or 20% goes, that in credit availability goes as your, your balance sheet increases. So it's a nice way to scale your available capital without having to go back and negotiate a new you know, $10 million line. Um, and last but not least, we, we mentioned that we had to buy stock to become a member. Uh, this most recent quarter, the stock paid 7.35%. So, so, it's, so it's, uh, it's a nice return on, uh, on the investment as well. If I could, I'd like to add, I really didn't talk, I guess, about the incentives um, for joining. And for us, we're, you know, being a CDFI, you know, those in the banking industry may not understand that we're non-depository, so we don't have the pool of funds yeah. that a bank has to loan from. So we have to get our funds from other sources. We have to get them from loans or from grants. Um, a lot of the, the loan capital out there for us to get is skyrocketing in rates. Um, we used to be able to get, our average loans that we would get would be two to three percent. Now we're getting quotes of six, seven percent. Um, and for us, that's, that's unsustainable. I mean, we have to really do about a four percent margin on them to make, you know, to make money ourselves and to survive. So one of the things with joining the federal home loan bank system, as Matt mentioned, is being able to um, get funds, use our loans as collateral, be able to, to, to get funds from the banking system so we don't have to keep that money out there quite so much and at a, low, you know, at a lower interest rate than we might get from an unsecured loan. Um, we also you know, can go directly through the federal home loan bank system for the grants, we don't. We previously we go through our, our one of our partners, um, Bay Bank out of Green Bay. They're a native-owned uh, bank, and we are a native-owned or we're a native CDFI, which does cause a little issue with with trying to do the the loans and things like that because a lot of our properties are on tribal lands, so it does make an issue. But we're working on MOUs and things like that to try to get that process through so that we can sell those loans or, or use those as collateral. Yeah, that was one of the questions, follow-up questions I was going to ask is unique to the native um, loans. Is there anything um, from the bank perspective you can talk about that issue, like what's needed for collateral? Yes, and I uh, know we have a, a panel later yes, that is, is talking about about collateral, uh, I, I also manage collateral at, at the Indianapolis Bank, so have have some some experience with there. So I think maybe just to tease tease some things up for the panel, just you know, regulatory requirements that we have with collateral that we can ascertain the value and that we can liquidate the assets. And then we have a conversation tomorrow about ways to partner with the enterprises. And so you know that that that's one thought is when we have. Um, loans on tribal lands, or we have um, a large population in Dearborn, Michigan, with Muslim and faith-based loans because it can't pay interest in the way those are, are documented. And so if there are cases where the enterprises are able to purchase some of these types of assets, is that a potential vehicle then it, that we could say in the, what I think is an unlikely event that we would need to liquidate? Is that a potential way to be to be made whole, or or to help us in, in that situation? As we, we you know look at um, partnerships, I think that word's coming up a lot today. Is are there other partnerships that we can make with other organizations that could potentially help with those regulatory requirements for some of these assets? And I think just to continue to to educate and to think more holistically about the CDFIs and 
we're, we're used as federal home loan banks to being able to look at balance sheet of different depository institutions, then you can compare them easily to each other. And we have a CD, CDFI that's my understanding, as CDFI that's investing in more in real estate is going to look different from the balance sheet of someone that's investing more in small business loans. And so the ability to try to compare that balance sheet with a depository that we're more used to or even comparing to each other. So ways that we can um, think differently about, about risk and, you know, and also what, what are the risks of not partnering and, and not engaging and are, you know, are there things that we can continue to learn uh, but I, I think that um, kind of pri primary conversation you keep having about the collateral is this requirement on, on valuing and, and liquidating the assets. Well, thanks. I'm glad you mentioned the um, diversity in the balance sheets um, that you're looking at from the bank perspective. And I think it's also the case that's an issue we've talked about. Uh, the CDFIs are dealing with 11 different federal home loan banks with different policies and procedures. Can you speak to... I, I don't know, I guess, have you had experience with other um, before NeighborWorks? Um, so, so I used advice? to be with uh, Capital Impact, uh -huh. which was also a member of the Atlanta Bank. Okay. Um, so with um, NeighborWorks Capital, we, we just joined uh, this year, so we actually haven't borrowed yet, uh, be, because many of our existing lenders uh, we have permitted lien language in our existing documents, so, so we have to work through that be, before we're able to pledge assets and, and borrow. Um, but uh, I'm sure uh, Jared will, will talk more about uh, capital impacts um, uh, borrowing. Um, but it, it, it was a good way to manage overall balance sheet asset liability mismatching just because we could borrow from overnight to you know longer term, 10 years, 15 years, at uh, competitively priced uh, rates. So w when we looked at our over, overall balance sheet asset liability matching, it was a good way to, to borrow and, and fill the gaps. Um. Yeah, we, we also just joined the Federal Home Loan Bank of Chicago. We're actually their newest member from what I understand and their first native CDFI member. Um, so it is, it's, we're still learning the, the ins and outs and the processes. We too are looking at our policies and the regulations that we're under to make sure that we can pledge the capital, make sure that's not a conflict, make sure we've just got all of our, you know, I's dotted and T's crossed, so to speak, but we are looking forward to that. Well, we're a little ahead of schedule. Should we, um, is there anything else you want to add or should we open it up to some questions? So I have one ad additional challenge from the federal home loan bank perspective that we've experienced, and that is needing to be U.S. Treasury certified, CDFI to join, and we have experience. We had a member that then, in the recertification process, lost the certification, so then not eligible to be a member was a member that had used our set-aside grants. We did not have competitive HP long-term obligations and it had not borrowed, but that would be a concern. We have this entity that has borrowed and now that they're not eligible to be a member. So as we look at, at certification, is, is there some way either as federal home loan banks that we, there's transactions that can help you all meet those requirements or is there a way when we're looking at the certification process to say, oh, this entity is a federal home loan bank member and, and so that would help. Uh, maintain that certification because that's certainly a challenge, potential challenge. I don't know how often do they come up for recertification? Is it every? How often is it? Every five years or? Every annual. Annually. 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 Okay, so this could be, just come up. Yeah, really the the often. CDFI fund, as she mentioned earlier, has new regulations. That's why she didn't want to take any questions <laughs> <laughs> on the recertification. <laughs> okay, sorry, but but there's new certification requirements. Okay. And so we're all kind of working through that. We're all trying to figure them out. I think they are trying to figure them out as well. Um, but it is definitely going to change the industry, and there are some, some things we've been able to do that we aren't going to be able to do. Um, you know, for us, one of the biggest issues for us, and I think most CDFIs, especially when it comes to home loans, is coming up with long-term capital. Um, we can get loans, we can get plenty of loans, we can get five, ten-year loans. Uh, actually, I think we're talking with the Federal Home Loan Bank of Chicago about it's, it's like a ten-year loan. The problem is to do a mortgage, you need 20 or 30-year loans. 
and we don't have, you know, some lenders will do renewable loans, but we can't necessarily count on that. So can we do, you know, uh, can we ethically do a 20 year or 20 plus year loan using funds on a 10 year renewable funding source? Um, so that's, that's one of the big issues for our organizations coming up with that kind of capital, that kind of, you know, capital that's longer term, that's 20, 30 year capital. We do have a nice loan from actually USDA to give them a shout out um, that is we're using in a low income housing project in northern Wisconsin. They're taking uh, one of the native organizations up there, one of the native housing organizations is taking 24 homes that were rental homes owned by the tribe and they are transferring them to home ownership. We're going to do all this in the next two years. Um, we're doing like 16 of them, I think, in January. And some of that money, or the majority of that money from USDA is going to be used to fund, I believe it's like 12 of those, those homes. Um, but, you know, again, you know, there's some regulation changes, I'm not going to get into those, that are tying our hands from being able to do some more creative financing things. And I get the purpose of them, but they do, you know, restrict things like being able to do... Um, uh, balloon payments or things where you can do like a 20-year loan, you know, and do a 10-year and then with a renewable 10-year. So that would allow us to use funding that's 10-year funding. We can't do that anymore with under the new, under the new regulations, or not regulations, under the new certification requirements. Um, and that is a problem. That's a problem for us for, for getting into housing. And um, so our big, like I said, honestly, our biggest issue is that long-term capital. And that is part of why we did join the Federal Home Loan Bank, is to try to find some of that, that longer-term capital to try to get some of the grants that they've got available. We are talking with them about some other loans and some other grant products that are going to help, hopefully help meet that, that longer-term capital needs. And another potential benefit along the access to capital line is there are Federal Home Loan Bank members, the depositories that are subject to CRA, we know are investing in CDFIs or purchasing loans originated by CDFIs for CRA credit. So our role as Federal Home Loan Banks as conveners and bringing our members together with community partners. So now you have this group of colleagues that are fellow members that could potentially also be interested in, in investment. And I, I have to, if you ask me a question, I don't know the answer, but I know someone who does, and, and so I don't know details about how that works, but there, I know there are people here that, that have had that happen that I can uh, hook you up with. But the, to also think about access to capital and as a Federal Home Loan Bank member with your fellow members that, uh, in, in your district that you can partner with. I think we're ready for questions, sir. Yeah. All right, great. Um, any questions from the room? As persons are thinking of the questions that they may have in the room, I do have some questions from online that we can start with. Thanks. Um, one is, can you talk about the differences in membership benefits received by CDFIs versus other member types? So, um, I Generally, as a member, uh, so in Atlanta, they, they have to treat all members equally. So, so the pricing we get on advances, it, it's exactly the same as if Bank of America were, were to take an advance. There, there are some differences w w with respect to collateral. So for example, you know, we, we might get a little bit of a bigger haircut as a CDFI. I think it's, is it 5% or 10% uh, be because we, we are not uh, regulated. So, so, so there are some, some differences, but in terms of submitting AHP applications, being able to, to get guarantees. Uh, as a member, we, we can vote in board elections. We can run for a you know, board seat in, in the state that, that we're um, a member of. So, so all that is, uh, is the same. Uh, there, there's another, another difference in terms of uh, risk rating. So I had mentioned those four uh, financial ratios. So it's 20% uh, net assets, uh, a uh, liquidity ratio, a loan loss ratio, um, and phone a friend. yeah, phone a friend. I know I, I have it written down. <laughs> um, 
Oh, um, a three-year change in net assets. Oh. Um, so uh, that's how we, we have to meet those four to be able to join. And once we're a member as a CDFI, if we fail to meet one of those in Atlanta, then our uh, credit rating changes from 101 to 102 to 103. And the haircuts and ability for us to borrow changes based on, uh, on that risk rating. And that is different for CDFIs as it is uh, as compared to banks. Again, that, those are some differences in Atlanta. Um, I don't know about Chicago or, or Indianapolis. I, yeah, I don't think there's really any difference in, for us versus a bank, but we are fairly new. We just joined like you, and I think it was actually February as well. Um, so it is a new process for us. We're learning it, but uh, my understanding is pretty much everything is, is, is equal. Yeah, there's Regulation 7J, so we need to treat all of our members the, the same. So we could have a rule about collateral would need to be more based on the way your a balance sheet looks like. We couldn't say CDFIs are this and insurance companies are this and depositories are, are this. We would have a something that, that the way your balance sheet looks or the percentage, and so then you would have these different requirements. Uh, there's community support statements that are required of, of members are not required of CDFIs that you know that you're meeting needs in community based on a designation. Uh, but that may be something we need to look at going forward as we talk about mission-oriented collateral and the recommendations of System at 100, different things that we could do. The potential is saying you can do these different things when you're working with CDFIs. Any questions in the room? I have some more from um, our virtual attendees. For years, bills to allow CDFIs to pledge non-housing loans as collateral and join as members as uh, CFIs have been introduced in Congress. How are the leaders of the federal home loan banks supporting bills, which would allow non-depository CDFIs that don't make home loans, but do make community development, small business, and agricultural loans, qualify for membership and advances? I think that question is more for you, but um, <laughs> uh, and, as part of our application, we had to show a certain percentage of our total assets was in uh, home loans. So, so even if you just do business loans, when you first join, you have to show that uh, I think it is 10% of your total assets has to be in, uh, in home loans. But I think the question is more how, how federal home loan banks yeah, so I'm, I'm understanding the question um, along the lines of, of how we're advocating, and uh, we do have Council of Federal Home Loan Banks is, that does some advocacy for us, and uh, do appreciate the opportunities that we've had with some recent the regulation on the affordable housing program and some advisory bulletins. Usually the community investment officers will see those ahead of time and have a chance to comment. Um, the, the, as we alluded earlier, when there's regulations and, and rulemaking process, just it's a very prescribed conversations and that we need to go through and, and our ability to give input. Uh, and so I think we, we are in a stage now where we are learning and we're exploring and we're curious and, and open to the opportunities. Uh, it may, in, in my opinion, may look like federal home loan banks have more opportunity to influence uh, those things than, than we may actually have. I, I don't know about joining actual membership, but the Federal Home Loan Bank of Chicago actually has um, they're helping us with some grants, or they've got some grants available for small business grants and things like that. So once you are a member, yes, we have to have, I don't remember what the percentage is. I thought it was a little higher than 10%, but of our, our portfolio has to be housing loans, but they do have programs to help, you know, business as well as home lending. I have another question. Some CDFIs have served as members of AHACs and boards. What impact has CDFI leaders, or has, have CDFI leaders that have served on the board and AHACs brought to the federal home loan banks? And how do CDFI leaders enable federal home loan banks to meet community needs as identified by CDFI leaders serving within the system? 
So I'm here today with our AHEC vice chair from CDFI and uh, current board member and former board members who have, who are or have been with, with CDFIs. And it's very valuable input and things that we, we don't often think about and having that different perspective. Uh, we, our most recent advisory council member who has uh, been very engaged, uh, just was approved in April. I have not had a chance to meet her uh, yet, Nikki Bash, who's at the uh, Native uh, Communities. Uh, so these opportunities, I think just in general from the advisory council and the independent directors that we have to, to learn different perspectives and, and have education. I think there are misperceptions that are out about the risk of a CDFI balance sheet. Uh, again, by nature, making loans that, that others aren't uh, able or willing to make, but that doesn't mean that they're not done with some risk metrics and, and risk mitigation. Um, so I think just having the, the, the opportunity to pick brains of these people and, and ask questions and, and listen and learn from each other, it's uh, very valuable that we can have this perspective on our advisory council and, and also on our board. And, and maybe two comments on that. So to serve on the Affordable Housing Advisory Council, you can't be an officer or director of, of the bank. So, so we as a member couldn't serve on the uh, advisory council. So, so I think that there's a distinction between if you're a CDFI member or a non-member of, uh, of the Federal Home Loan Bank. And then secondly, um, the, the way we're able to provide input, um, as I had mentioned last week, five of the Atlanta CDFIs had a lunch with the executive team. So, so they, they asked us, you know, what, what can we do that, that would be helpful for us? And we were able to provide input uh, to their leadership team in a way that we wouldn't be able to if we were not members. So, so we're able to have that opportunity, be at the table, ha ha and have those conversations. Um, I have a question specifically for Mary Beth. Can you talk more about the Detroit Hub and how other banks may implement something similar? Uh, well, the, the Detroit Hub is one of my favorite topics to talk about and uh, love, the, love the city of Detroit. Um, so, re repeating myself, uh, I guess a little bit from the beginning, but we are looking at, I think we all look at heat maps of our district and where our grants are going and we're seeing, um, in Michigan in general, we have, so we have states of Indiana, Michigan, just to, for those that may not know, in the Indianapolis Federal Home Loan Bank. And looking at heat maps and seeing not as many um, competitive HP applications, specifically even some of the other, the homeownership set-aside grants coming from Michigan. And in some cases, it's because we don't have member financial institutions there, or they're more rural areas. There, there's not development. It's not as much going on that there may be partnership opportunities. But in Detroit, that, that is not the case. We know there are that we know there's need and we know there are amazing people that are, are doing things. I mean, you know, seriously, that revitalization of the city of Detroit and bankruptcy is like, should be like case study um, in, in community development for the, the work people have done. So, um, very, very amazing. Uh, and so we're reading a lot about Detroit. We're not feeling that we know, we really can really learn. And, and so we said, let's go and, and listen more than we're talking. And, and, and as I looked at the time, what we did, I will admit, we did not say, let's go talk to CDFIs. But as I look, was you know, thinking of, about that and looked at the institutions that we talked to, that was, that was the first group, were CDFIs. And just that, that unique you know, financial institution perspective and, and knowing what's going on. So this is um, 2019. I'm going to Detroit about once a month and meeting with a variety of people along, along with other um, members of senior executive management. And uh, we decide towards the end of 2019 that it's, it's, we're not physically there, so let's have office space. And so we take a tour in February of 2020 of different office space in Detroit, and we're you know, looking at um, having workstations and all these offices and where's all the staff going to sit. And then in March, we had this uh, kind of change in, in the environment. And so we, uh, we continued, and like, who, who does this? We opened an office in downtown Detroit during a pandemic. Uh, we, we hired someone from the city of Detroit, uh, an advisory council member was, was nice enough to recommend someone from his staff for this open position. 
uh, Anna Shire's outreach partner, and she was willing to uh, go with a mask and FaceTime us and look at uh, uh, rental properties uh, that we could rent. Um, so we have 3,000 square feet in the Palms Building on Woodward, right across to the street from uh, Tiger Stadium and um, the uh, Tiger Stadium and uh, the all the the Lions. I don't know if you have my uh, Detroit teams here. Uh, so it's a great location that, that we love, and it's 3,000 square feet, and it does not have any offices or workstation for staff. It is collaborative space. It is available for our partners uh, free of charge. Our, uh, as we started doing this, though, our um, attorneys did make us come with a little contract that you all signed if you're going to use the space. Uh, so we, we have that, that in place now, a little application that you, you need an agreement. And um, we're, we're there regularly. The space is, av is available for, uh, for communities that we can have. We are hoping that uh, Director Thompson is making a visit to Michigan in July and that we can have a, an, an event there and show her this amazing space as, as well. So I, so this is, uh, I'm trying to give some of my remarks more as Federal Home Loan Banks in, in general. I think, you know, this is uh, Indianapolis, uh, Federal Home Loan Bank, and differences uh, among the Federal Home Loan Banks, but it's been really helpful for us to be in Michigan. It, it, you know, we all have these names where the Federal Home Bank of a city in a certain state, and then people in Michigan are like, why is this woman from Indianapolis talking to me about <laughs> affordable housing and uh, so I think sometimes it's, it's confusing so to it has made a big difference to be to have more staff there it gives us another market that we can recruit IT from and so it, we it's not just a community investment or account managers that we have in, in Michigan we've been able to also recruit uh, IT and uh, we try to you know go go there and, and meet with the staff there and have have events. It's a great uh, space that we can have um, member meetings and we uh, can host suites at one of the stadiums. And I mean, I, if, if, if you want to know, I guess it was an online question, so I have to answer a question. I'm talking about the breaks, but just a lot of benefits of knowing the community by being there physically for us. It's just been really helpful. And I think people just, you can tell a difference now in our partners in, in Michigan. Like, we understand, you know, what the, we know more what the Federal Home Loan Bank is and, and why you're here. So it's been, been a great benefit for us. And in a weird way, the pandemic helped because we got the right kind of space for collaboration and meetings as opposed to a place for people to work. Another question from a virtual attendee asked, what are the unique challenges that native CDIs face? And maybe we should start with David for this one. Yeah, um, you're talking about the, with joining the federal home loan bank system or just in general? I think uh, it may be both, if, if you can address both. Um, in general, I think, I don't want to get too much into collateral, but I was thinking about this earlier of mentioning it. Um, almost all of the homes that we lend on are on tribal land, so they're leased land. So you can't get a... Um, the, the assets basically will stay in control of the tribes if they go into default. So we can't, um, we can't uh, foreclose as well. And if we do foreclose, you get, you, know, you get rights to the house, but not the land it's sitting on. So that makes a lot of issues with finding funding and with working with banks um, for both the borrowers and for us, uh, because they can't, you know, when you can't foreclose, a bank doesn't want the asset. Um, we are working on some MOUs. There's a big push throughout the country to, to organize some MOUs with each of the tribes. And they have to be done individually with each, each tribe, each reservation, to set up that agreement. Um, and that's all due to the, the sovereignty laws and sovereignty um, with the individual tribes. So most of those are going to, I don't know how they're all going to look. I would assume most of those are going to end up being where the tribe has the right or had the obligation maybe to purchase the, the loan out, I think, is ultimately how those are going to work out. But that kind of, that plays in the, into our issue as well when it comes to funding. Most of our, our um, mortgage uh, portfolio is funded by these loans that are on tribal lands. And so we can't simply turn around and pledge them to Chicago Home Loan Bank because they won't accept them as collateral. We can't use them as collateral in other places as well. So it makes it a little more difficult. It also, we can't sell them to uh, Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac like um, most of the banks can do. So we are really limited on, on 
regaining our capital, and that's kind of where that 20 to 30 year loan money comes into play, is we can't take a loan and turn around in a year or two years sell it. Our goal is to get the clients bankable so in say five years or so they can go to a bank and get either a 184 loan if it's on tribal land or just a regular conventional loan if it's off tribal land. But that's, you know, that's kind of our goal to get to. Not everybody always gets to that point. So we have to look at each loan as though we're going to carry it out for 20 years and to even come close to making affordable housing. 30 years is, is not going to happen. We, we, you know, ideally, you want to be able to get to 30 years for affordable housing. We cannot hold a note for 30 years. Our, our, our funders, our board, uh, one of our board members is the president of a bank. And he's point blank said, you don't want to hold a note for 30 years. And so without being able to sell them or, or pledge them or use them in other aspects. So that's, that's the biggest, I think, hurdle for us as a, as a native CDFI. I think we have a, still a question. I just wanted to ask the question. Do you want a mic? Having the. A mic. Make, and identify where you're from too, please. Yeah. Joe Neary, CEO of IFF um, in Chicago, but office in Detroit. So how do you feel about the hub? Is the hub changing the heat map, right? Because the, the point of having the hub is to work on making sure the capital is flowing to Detroit. So how, how is that going? Yeah, so prior to the, the Detroit hub, the uh, and so we're doing, the, the, we opened in 2020, and we had the last competitive HP application from Detroit was in 2014. And so we hired someone in uh, April of 2020, Anna Shires, and I was going to be happy if in 2021 we had Detroit applications. Um, she hit the ground running. Uh, applications were due that year, probably in July. And uh, we received and awarded four competitive AHP applications in 2020 and, and have, uh, and, and I don't know at the top of my head the, the, what the dollars have added up in those past few rounds, but um, you know, our, we are, are seeing that. Uh, there also were differences with uh, the State Housing Finance Authority in Michigan, MISHTA, and how their tax credit applications work, and we've had, uh, with Anna's uh, leadership, have made progress in talking to MISTA about, I know you like to have majority of the funding, and, and again, I, I don't, you ask me a question, I know the answer, but I know who does, a half joke, uh, but difference between a 9% and a 4% deal, um, but especially the, the 9%, but we can get, we had some traction with 4%, like you could, telling MISTA, you know, you could, if, if, in the time we have a million dollars uh, max this year, but we had 500,000, we we're having these conversations, like, I mean, there's, you know, if there's four deals that we can put 500,000, that's $2 million that you can do something else with. And so trying to make some progress. Also, I think having the, the Detroit hub and the staff there helped us make some progress in general in the whole state with conversations with MISHTA. Um, that's led to a partnership with um, tribal housing uh, that we are committing $3 million to over, over three years. So uh, it's been beyond Detroit, as we were hoping, and, and throughout the state of Michigan in partnerships with statewide organizations. Mary Beth, there's another question for you. Is, if, is there one in the room at this point? Okay, another question for you, Mary Beth. Um, what are the voluntary program commitments that the Federal Home Loan Bank of Indianapolis will prioritize, and what percentage of net income, of net income is your goal? I thought all these all the questions are going to be for our members on the value of Federal Home Loan Bank membership. Uh, so um, I also like talking about voluntary programs, however. Uh, I've been with the bank a long time, and I did not think in my career I would have the opportunity to be this creative and, and innovative and do things on a voluntary basis. So I do not have a question, uh, answer for that that will I know will reflect all of my colleagues. I, but I think in general we are all looking at the needs in our district to set our voluntary. Uh, our priorities for voluntary programs. We all have a targeted community lending plan, so our regulated and voluntary programs are to stem from needs that we have outlined with market research. Our advisory council members, we, and we, we talked about uh, CDFIs as advisory council board members, that they 
uh, provide us a lot of information on needs in the district and, and unmet needs and things that we can do. We uh, like copying off, off of each other to come up with voluntary programs. If someone's done something that's been successful, uh, can we replicate that in our district? And again, and there's uh, I think a reason for the regional approach of the federal home loan banks. I think we have examples of dollars that have gone to very small communities that I'm not sure would have been dispersed that way if this was done um, on a national basis. Uh, and the, the approach that we can have as a federal home loan bank to work through our member financial institutions and learn what these needs are and, and get the dollars into communities, I think is very unique to the structure and the, the regional structure of the system. I believe there's also part of that question that talked about AMI. And again, I don't think collectively, I know we haven't had a conversation, so what is your AMI goal? I will say, the voluntary programs have given us, one of the things that we cannot do in, in regulation is go over 80% AMI. Uh, so we had a pilot program that we are um, going to hopefully announce here soon as a recurring program, um, Home Boost, which is a special purpose credit program. And uh, we have 120% AMI, and I think other uh, districts that have a special purpose credit program also have 120, or I have workforce housing programs. Um, there are needs that are greater than the 80% AMI, and to have the flexibility with these programs to uh, reach other people that are having challenges and struggles with their housing. I think especially when you're talking about home ownership and you have a limit of 80% of AMI, I mean, it's challenging for for someone, and we do have people at less than 50%, you know, 50, 60% AMI that use our down payment assistance grants. Uh, this gives us uh, a need, a way to reach people that there just really are not grant dollars out there uh, in those income levels to help, and I think it's an opportunity to be very impactful with, with our dollars. Okay, we probably have time for one more question, if there's any. I'll defer to the room first. So I didn't hear any of you talk about associate memberships. I know several of the housing finance agencies or local housing finance agencies may come in as an associate member. And the difference between being a member and an associate member, it'd be nice to hear that. So our associate members would be our state housing finance authorities. Um, so. Uh, able to borrow and still have collateral requirements, so then that's a, a hurdle for, for them as well. I think other districts have more uh, borrowers. Uh, again, it's different ways that you can partner that are different from a traditional depository institution. Um, associate members, though, are not able to use our community investment program advances or to apply for our grant programs, um, so that is uh, something that, that they cannot do, but the opportunity of access to capital, we have um, ways that we can in invest and, and support and, and support bonds and, uh, and other ways that we can invest with the housing associates, but I think that's the primary, they're not, not able to access the grant programs. I have one more from our virtual community. Um, can you talk about the value of community, uh, the Community Investment Program, CIP, and Community Investment Cash Advances, SICA, the, the advantages that these can provide to CDFIs, and are there any particular examples from the Federal Home Loan Bank of Indianapolis? Yeah, so we have... Um, most of the certified CDFIs in our district are uh, credit unions there, so we have them joining us, credit unions, look at them as a, a depository member. Uh, we have four non-depository CDFI members. Uh, one of them is a native CDFI in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and that's the only one that has borrowed so far and um, borrowed in our, our traditional uh, advances window. And so this, the community investment program, the, the CICA, the, the CIP, uh, that's a program we can lend at our cost for certain needs. And uh, I would think that would be a program that would be open to, uh, to CDFIs and that the work that they're doing would meet those criteria of in investing. You can uh, qualify on housing. Um, and that's 115% AMI. That's not a grant program, that's a lending program. And then there's 
differences on the economic development side, whether it's an urban or a rural area, there's ways if you're supporting small businesses or, or you're creating jobs, and that's where I tell people, just tell us what you're doing and we'll figure out which box it, it fits in. Uh, but I think what, you know, CDFIs in the communities that you're, that you're serving, that would be, be an opportunity. It just depends on the pricing levels and uh, how that is. And, and again, I know, just know enough to be, be dangerous, but I know people that can answer that question for you, um, how we're pricing ad advances and how much of a rate differential there is between uh, the regular ad advance window and the CIP, but that is the lowest cost advance that we offer. Yeah, so, um I took a CIP advance in a prior role with, with Atlanta, and I think it was like 10 or so basis points uh, lower. Uh, usually the, uh, the challenge we have as CDFIs is if we make loans, uh, we extend them a bunch of times, uh, and, and they actually run longer. Um, the uh, challenge we had with the CIP loan was actually we used a specific loan for the CIP advance, and that loan actually paid back early. So then we didn't have a specific loan for that CIP advance. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it, it lowers your cost by you know, 10 or so basis points in, in Atlanta. Uh, so, so it's a good way for CDFIs to, to get some, uh, some, some additional spread. Well, thank you. I think we're out of time. Thanks so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah thanks so much for having us. Thank you. Great, well thank you everyone. Uh, we're gonna go on a morning break now. There's still food and drinks outside. We'll reconvene here at 11.20. If I could get everyone's attention, we're gonna get started in just about 30 seconds here, so please take your seats. I'm going to welcome our next panel if you want to make your way up to the stage. All right, so if everybody can join me in welcoming our next panel to the stage to discuss CDFI credit risk. Joe, take it away. Thank you. Uh, welcome to Understanding CDFI Credit Risk. Um, thank you, Angela, Jarrett, Michael, Eben. Um, you can take a look at their bios online, but um, I think you'll agree that we have terrific expertise and experience here to tackle this issue. Um, just by way of introduction, I would venture to say that everyone in this audience, or nearly everyone in this audience, at some time in their career went through some kind of credit training um, or credit education, and whether you learned the five C's of credit or the four C's of credit or the three C's of credit, Google it, There's, um, uh, and whether you can remember them or not, you do remember one thing, which is that there's two fundamental questions that we're asking when we're looking at credit risk. One is, um, can the borrower repay? And second, if they don't repay, how can I be made whole? And that second question, the collateral question, which has already come up a number of times, um, is you'll have to wait in suspense until after lunch to really dig into that. But the question that my colleagues and I are going to talk about this today is understanding how we assess the credit risk at the enterprise level. And that's important to the banks because it has an impact on the lending terms that are extended to members, particularly around advances. And so um, we have this terrific group. Um, we're going to spend some time talking about the nuts and bolts of credit risk assessment. Um, 
I'm going to stick my neck out and ask them for their thoughts on what FHFA can do to um, further accelerate, make the credit risk assessment process more accurate, more efficient. Um, and then last, we'll take your questions. So um, the first thing I want to sort of dig into is the difference between non-depository CDFIs um, who, as uh, Pravina mentioned earlier, um, don't have a prudential regulator in the same way that banks and credit unions do. Um, and the distinction that the banks make between um, non-depositories and their depository members. Um, and I want to start with Michael and get the bank perspective on how you approach evaluating risk for non-depository CDFIs versus um, your insured and regulated members. Okay, yeah, I think that's a very, very good question. Uh, so overall, I think, uh, uh, as we all know, we have 11 different home loan banks. So our credit policies, practices are slightly different, but overall we are under uh, the same sort of home loan bank act and the same regulator of uh, FHFA. So there's some commonality um, in the approach we evaluate quite a risk. Um, just talking about, uh, for example, banks. Um, um, Typically, we uh, if you really talk about credit risk, essentially, actually, there are two parts of, of credit risk. Um, there's a um, um, first part is we have assigned a rating for for every member, regardless depository or, or non-depository. That's one part. Second part is the credit monitoring piece. So after you assign the rating, you uh, you continue to monitor their their credit. Uh, so. For the first part, I uh, think every home loan bank has a rating system. Uh, whether it's, uh, for example, dollars use uh, letter grade, A, B, C, D, and E. Uh, some other bank use one through 10. Uh, I, I mean, I, I heard Atlanta 101, 102, 103 ish. So, regardless, there's a, there's a number associated with uh, each um, um, member, pretty much like your. FICO score, right? Um, so essentially that uh, rating dictate uh, how you can conduct business with home loan banks. Uh, so their rating determines if you need to uh, deliver collateral, or, or once you deliver collateral, what the level of uh, haircuts would be. So that's rating that very important. Uh, so typically we evaluate their ratings through a CAMOS approach, right? We all know Camels, uh, capital adequacy, um, asset quality, um, management, liability, and the sensitivity to market risk. So essentially, we had to evaluate their uh, uh, financial reports uh, to make that conclusion. Uh, I think through our own audit and uh, regulations, we have to document our decisions. Uh, so every credit analyst essentially need to write up a credit review uh, when they make make a call of, of the rating, uh, which really in order to do that, you have to solely read through their financial reports. Uh, to put some numbers in perspective, uh, if you are a bank, it yeah, depends on your size. You file either uh, 051, 041 call report. Uh, that's uh, roughly uh, the line items is roughly between 1300 to 1900. So there's a size of uh, uh, financial reports uh, that you file. Um, so essentially, there's a, you can see there's a very comprehensive work. Um, that's, that's only the first part. So uh, uh, after you assign the rating, you uh, continue, continue to monitor um, their financial reports because they're ongoing requirements. So every quarter, we uh, uh, look through members' uh, call report. Um, Apparently, we cannot do, it. Uh, for example, Dallas has 800 members. We cannot do 800 reviews. So may, you will see many banks actually build a model to, to do that work. Uh, the, the model basically drank all the risk uh, for those 800 members. Um, and we also monitor their um, public news, any negative news on certain members. Um, uh, so more importantly, uh, we also have opportunities to talk to their 
regulators if we have any, any concerns. Uh, so that's the part. We, uh, for certain institutions, we can get their exam report as well. So those are the more like a third party assurance uh, that we are doing a good, good job on evaluating the risk. Um, uh, you can see uh, those things do not exist for CDFI. <laughs> so, uh, so the most comprehensive CDFI um, financial reports I think I have is uh, roughly um, 130 data points. Um, that's, uh, I think that's the most comprehensive financial reports we got. Um, there's no potential regulator of CDFI, uh, we, so we don't have anyone to talk to. So uh, more uncertainty is on uh, liquidation. So in the very unlikely event of liquidation, uh, we have to go to a, a court to get, get things resolved. So those are the more like uh, concerns um, in, in credit risk assessment for CDFIs. Um, so that's if you talk, the big difference is really relying, relying on, on, on these parts. Uh, the information availability, uh, lack of potential regulators, and uncertainty in the liquidation process. Thanks. Um, I want to go to Eben and sort of get the CDFI perspective on this and what, what might be missed in um, comparing non-depository CDFIs with um, the other traditional uh, bank members? Yeah, so great, great question. Um, so I will say, to me, it, it's a little bit like, uh, I'm trying to draw an analogy, maybe like a baseball analogy. I remember Moneyball was big several years ago when people said, oh, you know, let, let, let's look at the data. And there are these unknowns, and for non-depository CDFIs, don't have the same level of, of publicly available data. But the data that we do have is that non-depository CDFIs don't fail. They just don't. And I think the University of New Hampshire looked into it. They couldn't find any defaults. So they, they found some where the CDFIs like unwound intentionally and just you know folded up shop or, or merged. Um, the other thing I'll mention is you know Bank of America built a multi-billion-dollar portfolio lending to. CDFIs, and if you ask them about it, they will tell you just how great the loan performance is. Um, I don't, I don't think they've had any. They may not have had any losses. So it, it reminds me a little bit of you know, kind of traditional scout baseball scout saying, you know, this person has a bad batting stance, and they don't, they chase pitches out of the strike zone. But then you look and you say, okay, well, but all they do is get on base and hit home runs. So. You know, these, these things are true process issues to work through, but, you know, ultimately uh, the, the, the fundamental credit risk of a non-depository CDFI is extremely low, probably lower than the depositories. Um, Angela, you want to talk about um, kind of how you look at, as you're the internal risk manager for your institution, um, how you compare the assessment that you undergo as a bank member to your internal assessment um, and management of credit risk and, and how your investors look at it and are there um, key metrics or measures um, that, you know, that maybe are missing or maybe are under, underweighted in, um, assessing, in assessing a CDFI? Yeah, so I'll start with the first part of that question um, and say that in terms of our Federal Home Loan Bank of Chicago, um, they are very similar to our other kind of bank investors. So shout out to Federal Home Loan Bank of Chicago. I see a few <laughs> of them in the room already. Um, so I think it, it's very similar, which I think is great. Um, their covenants are similar, the type of documents that they um, request to get to the overall credit assessment or the risk rating um, seems to be very similar to a lot of our other bank investors. Um, so that makes it very easy. So if there's any CDFIs in the room or online that are thinking about becoming a member, um, and you think that you're gonna need to go through all of this other extensive underwriting, I think a lot of it is similar to other investor investments. So I would start with that. Um, and then the second part of your question in terms of kind of what do I wish was weighted more? Um, 
So I would say one thing is self-sufficiency ratios. Um, when I think about CDFIs in particular, especially non-depositories, we're usually both a um, nonprofit and we're a financial institution. And so when you think about that nonprofit piece, we receive a lot of grants and those grant amounts can fluctuate, right? Um, so we had someone from the CDFI fund speak and there are a lot of grants. If you got an ERP award, it may have inflated your earnings for a particular fiscal year. Many CDFIs received money from McKinsey Scott. So if you got this $10 million grant, um, it may have inflated your earnings. And so I think a lot of the questions that we get when we're talking to investors or the federal home loan banks is about our fluctuations in net income. Oh, you had a $5 million net income in fiscal year 2022, but in fiscal year 2023, you're down to a million. So tell me why that is, or it's seen as a risk because our, our earnings aren't that way. So I wish that there was more weight put on self-sufficiency ratios, which kind of tells you how reliant the organization is on grant funding, right? So the higher the self-sufficiency ratio, the less reliant you are on grants. And so I think really looking at that and seeing that a lot of the grants that come in are not necessarily for CDFI's operations, but a lot of times they're actually um, capital that's going into our lending pool to reduce the interest costs um, to our borrowers, right? Or for a particular program or something of that nature. So I wish that that was something that was a little bit more focused on. I would say the second thing that I wish was a little bit more focused on, um, a lot of organizations, investors look at our net asset ratio and they just look purely at that. They want you to have a blanket 20% or 25% net asset ratio. Um, but I think when you're looking at a CDFI's balance sheet, you really have to look at the, the rest of it to understand the strength. A lot of us have subordinate debt, um, EQ2s. So if you think about that, it's the net asset ratio and our EQ2s. So we have a very strong base. And then, you know, to your point, we don't have very many losses. So if you compare that net asset ratio and the subordinate debt, to our overall loss ratio on the CDFI's balance sheet, you'll see that we have a lot, a lot of cushion. And so I wish when looking at that net asset ratio that organizations didn't just look purely at that and say you have to have this flat percentage, but looked at the overall balance sheet, overall losses when really thinking about that. Yeah, great observations. Um, I want to turn to Jarrett. Um, momentous, at least of the three CDFI's that are sitting up on uh, the platform right now, um, you, uh, Momentus has uh, ratings from Fitch and S&P, um, and it, how well do those ratings uh, reflect the financial health of your institution? Um, and again, what's missing? What, um, what, what aspects um, do maybe the traditional ratings um, not, not tell? Yeah, um, so I would say it's a pretty deep dive uh, into our um, operating performance. Um, strength of management, I think that's one thing that we, we should probably highlight across the CDFIs. We have extensive uh, experience from industry prior to coming to CDFI, some from bank. Uh, so they look at that. Uh, they also look at our portfolio. They go loan by loan, uh, see whether or not, you know, it's cash flowing, if it's, you know, if it's, you know, construction or uh, facility uh, loan. They look at credit enhancement. They look at uh, guarantees. Uh, it's a process that annually, even though they know us, takes, could take about two months of uh, back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, so they really drill down into each loan. Um, they also uh, look at our um, underwriting guidelines. Uh, they mention our risk ratings, uh, how robust they are. They look at our, uh, they mention our, you know, prudent risk management, um, you know, and that we're, you know, we're high touch, you know, on our borrowers. Um, our goal is, you know, the mission. Um, so we work with our borrowers, um, and we're pretty uh, in contact with them pretty often. Um, uh, and then on the Fitch side, they look at us on the at the enterprise level. Uh, they look at us as a normal business. Uh, they actually put us in their um, ratings criteria with um, non with banks and non bank financial institutions. So that's kind of where we sit in their group. Um, so they do you know a pretty good uh, deep dive. Uh, from top to bottom, they want to hear about our strategy. Uh, it's not just hearing about the strategy, but how, how do we plan to execute? Um, so I would think it, it's very thorough. Um, and we've been rated at least since 2017. And there are up to, up to 15 
uh, CDFIs that at least have one rating. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a that's a heavy lift, though, to get that rating. Um, what would you say to CDFIs that haven't um, that uh, that haven't gone that route yet? Um, and how much how much of an impact does it have on um, how you're treated by your home loan bank? So I'll answer the, the last question first. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't think we've talked about it. We'll get to uh, Michael on time. that in a second. Uh, but <laughs> about our ratings. Um, is it worth it? Um, for us, it has been. Uh, so we've, we've accessed the capital markets uh, for the last, last seven years. Uh, so we've added that as one of the uh, tools in our tool toolkit. Um, it also gives um, some of our uh, folks that we're going to do partnerships with. It gives them more confidence. These, you know, this organization is rated by both, um, you know, S and P, Fitch, and then we have an ARIS rating too. So that you know kind of makes it you know really helpful. Um, as far as the lift, I would say the best the best way to kind of think about it is you know if it's something worth it, you just have to prepare for it. And just start thinking about it, you know, two, three years out. Like, what does our loan tape look like? You know, can I leverage some of the, the knowledge that the CDFIs that are rated? Can I leverage some of their uh, their learning um, in the process uh, to try to prepare for that? Um, so I would say I would say it's worth it, but just make sure that it it's you know not just worth it from a qualitative standpoint, but quantitative, like in dollars, uh, and that you can access multiple sources and you can leverage it in multiple in ways. Mm. So Michael, from the bank perspective, how important are the traditional ratings from the, uh, I can't remember what the acronym is, from the uh, R RSO? Yes, yeah. thank you, uh, rating, uh, rating yeah. agencies. Yeah. I think uh, um, uh, from uh, CDFI's perspective, if you want to get access to capital markets, uh, I think having a, an RSO rating is very helpful. Uh, for home loan banks, it's also a very helpful information. Um, I think for home loan banks, we have our own regulation that basically asks us to, uh, the word they're using is there is uh, not solely rely on RSO. Uh, so even if you have an RSO rating, we still have to perform our own review. Uh, but having that information is very helpful since, um, for example, the, the first issue I talked about, there's not much information available uh, from CDFIs. So having a written report in front of me, help truly help me make the decision. Uh, so essentially, um, we talk about um, think CDFI, um, sort of actual risk of CDFI. Um, actually, I think there was a study, uh, I think by DNB. Uh, mm -hmm. DNB uh, tracked, I think, 1,500 CDFIs uh, for 20 years, uh, since 2014. Uh, from their tracking, actually, there were none bankruptcy. Actually, there were not zero, but then nine, uh, nine bankruptcy. But it's, it's still a small number. Um, uh, if you add some other thing together, roughly, uh, I think the feeder rate uh, from this fifteen hundred sample is five percent. Uh, so, uh, if you track banks um, for the past twenty some years. There were roughly 10,000 banks ever existed. So 500 banks failed. So roughly 5% uh, as well. So I would think from that standpoint is, uh, I mean, the, the risk probably equivalent to banks. It's not much higher, but not much lower. Um, I think really the, the issue here is I just don't have enough information to differentiate the risk. Right? Um, I cannot consider all CDFI the same. Some CDFI is better. Uh, so essentially, the rank order issue, uh, I think having an RSO rating certainly help. Uh, sometimes even not an RSO, uh, like a smaller rating agency like Irish, uh, that's rating also very helpful. Um, basically, it helped me to differentiate the, the, the risk. Just yeah. say, uh, you. Jared mentioned it, Eris, and you, you mentioned it as well. And I think um, all of all of the institutions on this platform, and I think most um, or majority of the industry, the CDFI industry, has Eris ratings. Just can you say a little bit more about what that is for folks that may not be familiar with it? Um, yeah. So Eris, um, I think, is a specialized rating agency uh, for CDFIs. Um, interestingly. Uh, um, 
not sure there's um okay so I, I i tell you one story maybe uh so seven years ago uh there was another ctfi conference in dc and uh, at that time i served as a chair uh, of the system credit group so um so i had had to speak uh, up for the credit concerns on cdfis so as you can tell, I'm, I was not the most popular speaker in the conference. <laughs> so, but uh, anyway, uh, after afterwards, actually, we see something uh, positive happening. Uh, for example, more uh, CDFIs sign up for ARIS reading. Uh, actually, much better, more if you, if you, even if you do not have ARIS reading, um, ARIS provide standardized quarterly reports uh, for the CDFIs. And that service is free for CDFIs, but I pay a subscription. So they earn money from me, not from you. Uh, but that really provide me convenience getting data together. Uh, so I don't have to chase you for financial um, quarterly. I get that automatically from uh, uh, Iris. I think um, if you're familiar with banks, right, there's a something called the UBPR. Right, the in, in FFIEC called the uh, uh, Uniform Bank Performance Data uh, Performance Report, meaning you can pull any bank's core report and compare to peers. I uh, think it is, is trying to create something similar. Uh, I mean, not only they got your own, got your whole financials. The uh, they told me maybe two weeks ago they are creating something in peer analysis for CDFIs. Yeah, so all this uh, improvement, I think, just we see happened in the past few years. Thanks. Um, you know, we talking about CDFIs. Part of the reason that the CDFI um, CDFI designation emerged some thirty years ago was to reach parts of the market that weren't being reached by traditional um, institutions. And as the director and um, uh, 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 the director of the CDFI fund. Um, said earlier, they remains a critical part of the CDFI mission is reaching underserved and unserved um, parts of the market. Um, and that inherently involves greater flexibility and the ability to take risks um, that other institutions might not take. And I'd like to just throw out to our CDFI panelists, um, what are the sort of risk management, risk mitigation tools that um, are important in addressing in managing those risks or that perceived, possibly maybe perceived risks, um, and how do you deploy those in your in your business? Um, I'll start down at the end with Eben and then we can work our way back this way. Yeah, I feel like, you know, it's really comes down to the management team, the board of directors, you're, you're assessing an institution that has a business. You're also really assessing that business strategy, to your point, Joe, about uh, an organiz a CDFI, an organization that's serving people that are not otherwise well served by financial institutions, oftentimes that strategy is a better strategy than, say, an organiz a business that's serving very affluent people in a highly competitive market. So in that sense, you know, you can also take a step back and just evaluate the the business itself and the markets that they operate in um, and then look at the management team and see how well do they understand the markets that they're uh, that that they're that they're doing business in and I, I would just say at the kind of the transaction level right uh, there are a number of different types of credit enhancements um, that take first loss prior to our exposure being at risk right so that's one um, there are personal guarantees, there's corporate guarantees, but then there are state guarantees, right? Um, on our small business side, there are federal guarantees. Um, so I would say, you know, there are a number of enhancements um, that we've made uh, based on our exper collective experience um, that mitigate, you know, mitigate the risk where we could identify, okay, if this happens, where are we at risk? Um, and we have a number of folks that have been doing this uh, for years and nothing really I could probably say nothing passes any of our credit committees without being fully uh, covered. Uh, so we just don't, you know, we just don't pass deals along just because there's high p impact in the, uh, in the community. We look for other partners, we find other ways to be more creative to get that deal done. But as is, deals have to go back and, you know, 
be uh, restructured. Yeah, and I, I echo the comments of the other panelists. Um, I'm gonna come at it from a slightly different perspective just to give something new um, and kind of talked about some of the soft skills that I feel like CDFIs have. Like one thing that we do is we're not just the lender, we all provide technical assistance as well. It's one of the requirements of the new CDFI recertification. So um, everybody provides technical assistance as well and it's not just workshops and things like that. If you think about our portfolio management teams, the asset managers, they are providing technical assistance. They are helping the borrowers. So if the borrowers ever get to a point where they um, are experiencing some challenges, our teams come in and they help those borrowers. And I feel like that um, is a big risk mitigation factor. Um, and I would just say, as, as you already mentioned, um, being very creative in the deals as well um, really helps us to not experience any of those losses. Well, that's a great point, and that that um, in the CDFI certification, which I know we're not supposed to talk about, that's referred to as development services, correct? Um, but that's a key, a key differentiator and it's part of the reason that CDFIs use grant, um, grant funding. Um, the, uh, just, um, I was gonna, I, th I think we talked about grant funding a little bit um, and the, um, the use of uh, a, um, uh, uh, you know, traditional earned income ratio as a metric. Any further sort of observations on that? Because that does seem like a big, um, it's something that um, changes the appearance and the character of CDFI balance sheets as the presence of those grant funds. And um, are there better ways to, you know, better ways to understand that because of the way it skews earnings? Yeah, I think I kind of answered this earlier, so if you know. Yeah, I'll just put a, just a, probably a different spin on it, right? Um, so when folks look at uh, grant income, they look at this free pile of cash is just going and we're getting it every year and we're saying, you know what, looks like we're short a dollar, we're going to get two next year, remember, right? We're not, that's not really how it works, right? I would say that uh, grants are more like contracts, right? So if you have a large contractor, you're, you're trying to evaluate the backlog, right? So that's multi-year grants. You're trying to evaluate the management's uh, team's capability in executing on that backlog, right? And then you're also looking at how many different contracts that contractor has. Well, it's the same thing for most CDFIs. We have a diversified pool of grants, and every year there's multiple multi-years going in. So every year we're adding that grant revenue that you're seeing in subsequent years, it's being released for the expenses. And then some of the expenses that you're seeing, they're directly grant related, mm -hmm. related. So if they're not there, if the grant's not there, then those expenses aren't there. So I would say that you could probably, at least for CDFIs, I would count it to, cer to a certain extent. I would count it and understand it. And then, you know, if it turns out that, you know, maybe 80% of those grants are more like contracts, then you can include that, but I wouldn't exclude it from earned income. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at Inclusive, I mean, the way that we monitor our ongoing operational income is to look at what is the operate, what is our net earnings of, or the, you know, the net margin at the organization if we removed all of the grant revenue and the associated grant expenses. So I think, you know, just on the top line, we're at, you know, 65%, something like that, self-sufficiency. Self but by our own metric, removing those expenses at what, as well, we're at like 97, something like that. One other thing I would just mention about kind of non-depository CDFI balance sheets that relative to maybe the, you know, uh, banks or regulated institutions is just that if you, the 20% net asset ratio, I think that came, I don't know where it came from, honestly. It came from the beginning of CDFIs. And everyone was scared about the loan performance, so we said, we well, gotta have 20%. And now there's been 30 years of incredible loan performance, and we're still at 20%. And typical, so like, what equivalent? What's the equivalent like Basel capital ratio for that? Most most non-depositories gonna have like 20% of their balance sheet in cash. So you know, what's your Basel capital ratio? 40%. It's kind. Of, it's like it's crazy. The low leverage is not commensurate with the the loan performance. And this kind of gets back to the profitability question around grants. That low leverage does have an effect on earnings. CDFIs would be uh, more profitable 
if they could lever their balance sheets more appropriately to the low risk assets that they're holding. Thanks. I um, want to give all of you a shot at what FHFA might do, um, hypothetically, to uh, reduce some of the lingering misperceptions around credit risk associated with CDFIs, and, and more generally, to increase, from the bank's perspective, the efficiency um, of assessing credit risk, and from all of our perspectives, the accuracy of assessing credit risks. Um, so uh, whoever wants to jump on that first. Uh, I'll start. Okay. Um, we talked a little bit about ARIS ratings, um, and I think on the previous panel I heard someone say that their federal home loan bank relies on that ARIS report for quarterly reporting. Um, but I think relying on the ARIS report is something that is very key. Uh, we give a lot of information um, to kind of the, the ARIS organization to get that rating, and so I think relying on some of that and kind of standardizing it across some of the federal home loan bank systems um, for their underwriting and credit assessment um, could be something that could help? So uh, I'll say um, encourage collaboration amongst the CDFIs and the member banks as the leader of the discussion, mm -hmm. the leader of the analysis, the leader of you know, this project, right, with a defined timeline, with defined milestones on when we want to get things done, but led by the FHFA. So there's no, you know, so there's nothing lost in translation. When we come up with solutions between us and the member banks, we don't have to run back to the regulator to say, well, does this work? Well, if the regulator's in the room at all times through the process, I think we, we can eliminate that and we can get there a lot quicker. But this isn't really a, a hard problem to tackle. There are a number of different ways we can tackle it, and I think there's some evidence and loan, loan portfolio data that allow us to get there. Hopefully, today's convening will move us forward in that direction. <laughs> yeah. I, I think the only thing I would add to that is just that getting more non-depository CDFIs in the door isn't enough. I think um, it was mentioned earlier that like only half of the members of the FHLB system have borrowed, the non-depository CDFI members have borrowed. So if we get a lot more in the door, but we're still only batting 50% on how many have taken advances, then, you know, it's... It, this is really only one piece of this puzzle. Michael, we didn't get oh. your perspective on FHFA. Right, just <laughs> from, from the bank's perspective, I think yes. hearing all, all, all these, these uh, um, good comments. Uh, so um, some reason why um, many uh, CDFIs haven't borrowed is largely because of uh, collateral issue. Uh, I think we are going to talk about collateral in, in, in the afternoon session. Um, also, there's a haircut issue, the level of uh, haircut that home loan banks on, 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 on those collaterals. Um, I think there's um, a lot of this stuff actually is based on our own regulations. So we have certain requirements that uh, we have a, put a price tag on every collateral. So we only take those collaterals that we can evaluate. And uh, there's certain requirements on how we uh, calculate um, haircuts for each type of, of collateral. And those uh, uh, type of collateral that you can pledge to home loan banks are, are, are also prescribed by regulation for for certain type of institution. So and uh, uh, also there's a thing we talk about uh, something called seven J in, in the first session. Uh, so we have to treat all member equally. Uh, so but I think CDFIs are very different. So it probably makes sense to have a separate policy just for CDFI. Uh, but under 7J, we cannot do do this as of today. So those things, I think, probably just inviting um, uh, agencies' help to to help us sort out. Yeah. No thanks. And I'm not I'm not the person to comment on 7J. Um, someone else can do that. Um, let's uh, open it up to questions from all of you and from uh, the anonymous people online. Um, <laughs> Uh, in the back of the room and then up front here. Uh, Nick Mitchell Bennett, Rio Grande Valley Multibank, CDFI. Um, and um, so uh, I, this question is for, for Michael. Michael's been great to work with. We're, in the, we're a member of the Dallas Bank. 
um, and really trying to understand us. My question is, is for Michael and the other credit officers of the other 10 banks, is there anything that you learned when underwriting insurance companies that can be applied to us or you thought outside the box for them? Um, can you start thinking the same way for, for us that are in CDFIs? Yep, that's a very good question. Um, I think in terms of insurance, okay, they are not federally regulated, but they, are, they have each state regulator. So they have a state regulator. Uh, they also perform exam for those insurance companies. Um, so that's one. Uh, second is, um, even if insurance companies are state regulated, they do have a federal agency. It's, more, it's not official agency, it's more like a voluntary uh, agency that uh, all insurance put together called NAIC. I forgot the full name, but it's NAIC. The NIC basically set up reporting standards for all insurance companies. So they, they end up having same reports. So um, I mean that NIC report actually is more comprehensive than a core report. So I, I mentioned, uh, I think that the, the line items for a core report range between 1300 to 1900. So a core report can easily double that. So there are a lot of uh, requirements uh, for those reporting. And uh, also that uh, uh, NAIC, um, they have a different working group to solve problems. Uh, for example, they, they, have, uh, they, they even have a FHLB working group to solve the issues deal with the home loan banks. So I think, yeah, something in this practice, maybe um, the CTFI friends, we, we can learn. Uh, so up here in the front. Yes, this question is for Jarrett. Okay. Can um, you just say, say your name? Oh, Christopher Blair, the Community Alma Trust. Not to put you on the hot seat, Jarrett, but um, you've definitely used your um, ratings um, for um, issuances of debt and been one of the leading CDFIs. And I'm curious, do you see any limitations on using the federal home loan bank system, given that you are rated? And have you heard any feedback from S&P and Fitch, given they're rating effectively unsecured debt? So... Yeah, the, I would say the limitation is really the, the collateral um, challenge. Um, our portfolio is probably close to $600 million now, and there are a number, there's a high percentage of loans that we could uh, pledge if they were within the guidelines. Um, I would say that's, that's kind of been challenging, um, but hopefully that could be changed uh, with, this, with this discussion, at least trying to get lower haircuts because our rating, our internal rating will be better because we have um, a credit rating. Um, and then what was your, the second part of your, your question? Have you heard any feedback directly from that? Regarding the Federal Home Loan Bank? No, not at all. I feel like we're the uh, warm up act for the collateral panel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's another question in the front here. Um, I know there's. Hi, I'm Chuck Wall from Renaissance Community Loan Fund. We're in the Dallas Bank, and no, we, Nick and I did not uh, have plants for these questions, but <laughs> this question is for Mike, Michael. Uh, the CDFIs that are rated by um, S&P or Fitch, mm -hmm. are they treated the same as the CDFIs that are not rated from a collateral haircut perspective or a uh, rating? or? A, and if they are, then what's the value in getting a rating? Um, so far for Dallas Bank, so I'm talking about my own experience. Uh, we don't have CDFIs that are rated by an RSO. Uh, maybe have one joining, but uh, um, so from that part, I just don't have experience to tell whether this helped me. Uh, but as I just talk about having that RSO report, RSO rating, is more serve as a third party assurance of uh, a CDFI's financial in reporting integrity, operation, management capability, et cetera. Since you guys do not have a regulator, they don't receive exam, uh, I think that part of our so reading and uh, their, their report 
uh, serve as a very good supplemental information to help me make make a better decision. Uh, so just just for example, if I have two CDFIs, right, they look the same. One has an ISO rating, or single A. One one doesn't have any. I probably read the one with an ISO higher since I have some assurance on that part of uh, operation. We have one question over here, then over there, and then in the back of the room. Um, Thank you. My name is Brooke Carrillo. I'm with Redwood Trust, non-bank, not a um, CDFI, but a prior FHLB member. Um, my question was that in a prior life, we, um, you know, I had looked at capitalizing a CDFI. Um, We've talked today about some of the challenges around the inability, um, you know, some of the, I guess, developments in the ability to, um, you know, issue rated debt, but also some of the challenges that the reliance on grants bring. And I, I think um, in, in the prior exercise just illuminated that there were a lot of complexities around providing equity capital or longer term capital um, in the form of preferred even to CDFI, so I was just wondering if there have been uh, any developments in your exp kind of collective experience up there um, to simplify some of those, or if you have experienced those for your within your own organizations. So does anyone want to take that on? A little bit, a little bit. Uh, it's a really interesting question. I think it's a little bit beyond our scope here. I, Michael, did you have a comment? Um, yeah, maybe from, from Dallas' standpoint, I think yeah. we um, we do have CDFI borrow from us. Um, also, we have products that range from overnight all the way to, I think, up to 10 years. And we don't have any CDFI borrow for 10 years, but we do have uh, depository CDFI borrow longer term for their uh, asset liability mismatch issue. So, yeah, I mean, in that sense, uh, Home Loan Bank does offer um, a range of products to, to meet your SL liability needs, just one. Uh, second, I think from Dallas standpoint, um, I think we recently announced, uh, for example, that we call CDSFP program. Uh, it's a reduced haircut program just for, uh, for community support. I think a few CCDFIs are Chuck, but you, you can't see, speak about that. So they already signed up for their program. Uh, there's this one uh, available product for CDFIs. I think maybe a few weeks ago, we announced uh, something called uh, Canopy program, which is more like a recoverable grant or, or unsecured loan up to 10 years uh, for CDFIs. Uh, I think that will, will probably generate more impact um, Nice job with that, by the way. That's good. Um, back, back. Uh, Tia Patterson, California Community Reinvestment Corporation, and I want to welcome our new president with the San Francisco Federal Home Loan Bank, San Francisco. Um, so our, we just recently became a member. Um, we have a SAP credit rating, and we are regulated by the state of California, and we are treated exactly the same. And the haircuts are just as big as if we didn't have any of those. And so it, that this education component, I think, is very important because we know there's 11 different federal home loan banks. And so if one bank is treating someone a little differently than another bank that has those qualifications that you're looking for when you're evaluating credit risk, I think that's a bit problematic. And secondly, I'm really looking, I don't have an ARIES credit rating, but we report into ARIES because we're both a CDFI bond guarantee program and tr Treasury uses the ARIES for their fiscal reporting. And when we became a member of the Federal Home Loan Bank, we use the ARIES system. So I don't know how many of the Federal Home Loan Banks in the system mm -hmm. are using ARIES, but I wanna go back to that ARIES system and the standardizing because it really is kind of that piece that you all are saying is missing, where like CDFIs get compared to like CDFIs, and you really can evaluate that credit risk. Yeah. 
that's very, that's, that's very good point. Essentially, like I said, there's, there's no UBPR for CDFIs, so Aries is actually creating a more like a de facto UBPR for CDFIs. So that's a, that's a very good good development. Uh, so I think uh, with more CDFIs signing for their service, it's, it's free for you. So uh, I think that that information availability piece will improve. Um, also talk about education. I think probably my view on this is probably education is two way. Uh, CDFIs learn uh, how uh, home loan bank evaluate their their credit risk. I think we probably also need to better learn how you guys manage your own own credit risk. Uh, we I do recognize that CDFI has very low charge off rate. Uh, your delinquency is higher uh, compared to a normal bank. But you end up having almost a similar sim sim level of, of charge off. I think uh, I read a uh, Fitch research. I think your charge off bank is roughly 48 basis point. You guys have 50. So almost the same level, but uh, uh, the level in delinquency loans are quite different. Yeah. So. And, and it's the same for CDFI credit right. unions. So, yeah, CDFI so credit unions, same thing. True. I mean, yeah. delinquency is higher, but right. the charge off rate right. is same or lower. Uh, you guys tend to manage high touch customers. So what's your secret sauce? I uh, probably want to learn more. Uh, so it's just a Account <laughs> Account Accountability to the target market definitely helps. Uh, yeah, that's One, that. really, um, yeah, Education is, is, is a two-way lesson. Yeah. We, we need to learn from you as well. Uh, One, One, I think we have time for one last question here in the back. Oh boy, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> um, thanks, Joe. Mark Curtis from the Massachusetts Housing Partnership. Um, I, um, this is a great discussion with everybody in the room together, and I, I want to make sure that we focus on root causes of the challenge that Michael was talking about, which is that a lot of CDFIs who are members don't borrow, and a lot of CDFIs who are not members aren't interested because of uh, the, the challenges to borrowing. And I think that that boils down to, to primarily two things. One is the collateral haircuts, and we're going to talk about that this afternoon. And the other is um, the CDFI credit risk issue. And I would say um, particularly around the risk of bankruptcy and how that permeates and affects the way that the banks look at that risk, evaluate that risk, and then um, punish CDFIs um, and other uh, uh, mission-based lenders um, because of that risk of bankruptcy. Just one very quick example of this. Um, we're a, um, a state housing finance agency, a, a public instrumentality in Massachusetts. Um, so we basically can't go bankrupt. And yet um, we're being um, assessed a risk of going bankrupt that affects and permeates um, the borrowing that we uh, can do from Federal Home of Boston. And we're told that that is regulatory. Um, and I'm wondering, um, can we be more specific about what in the statute and in the regulations um, specifically requires that um, very conservative approach to the infinitesimally small risk of mm -hmm. bankruptcy for a well-rated CDFI or other mission-based lender, mm -hmm. and how much of this is about interpretation and policy and, frankly, culture? Mm. Yeah, it's a partially culture. <laughs> um, so home loan bank, you know, unlike a commercial bank, right? Uh, you can a commercial bank can tolerate a credit loss. It's a, a swing in number five percent. So home loan bank is zero. So essentially, we are not supposed to have a loss. So our principle is to uh, to manage towards a zero loss principle. Uh, so that's uh, probably the fundamental reason of many conservative credit policy you have you have seen with home loan banks. So that's probably true. Uh, secondly, really the uh, the bankruptcy issue. Um, as, as I said, there were. My research uh, identified roughly nine, nine CTFI bankruptcies that passed, uh, but there is no further information. The only, no, only the information I know are those names, are those nine names. There's no research on how the, resolve, how the bankruptcy got resolved and how quickly that got resolved. 
So those, I think those outcome uh, actually are very important since uh, um, many things baked into haircut is really the how long I can liquidate that collateral and how, and how I liquidate that collateral. So if there's more uh, information available on um, CDFIs, um, sort of failure history, and the case study on those failure history, uh, that certainly will help all the credit managers, uh, not only in home loan banks, but in other um, equity funds as well. Thank you, and thank you all for the great questions. Um, let's thank this panel. Um, it's a terrific conversation. Now, going to break for lunch. Um, we'll resume at 1.10. If you're here at Constitution Center, you can go either way to get food. So we will see you in about one hour. Thank you. Good afternoon. If you all may find your seats, we are ready to resume the second half of our program. Thank you again for those of you who have joined us in person, as well as for those of you who, have, who, have, uh, who are, excuse me, joining us virtually. Uh, we do hope that you all enjoyed your lunch, your break, you had time to catch up on emails and other tasks, but moreover, especially for those of you in the room, we hope you had an opportunity to network um, and engage with your colleagues in between the CDFIs, FHFA, and the Federal Home Loan Banks. Um, as many, if not all of you know, the Federal Home Loan Bank System at 100 Initiative, focusing on the future, uh, produced a very comprehensive report which had a number of recommendations to increase Federal Home Loan Bank support for housing and community development. So here to give us an update um, on where we are with advancing those recommendations in the report are Associate Director Amy Bogdan and Supervisory Economist Lisa Pena. Thank you, LaRonda. All right, now they showed me which button and, mm -hmm. okay. We will turn it to the first slide. And it, and, it, and it came up with the right one. Okay. Um, Lisa and I are here to present a brief update on the System 100 initiative. Um, although many of you work for one of the banks or for a member institution, I think there may be some people in our audience, possibly um, on the, especially online, who may be less familiar with the bank system. So I'm gonna give a really brief background on the bank system. Uh, and uh, I encourage you to look at the report where there's much more information. And here's my prop for those in the room that can see it. Um, that's, this is a copy of the report. Um, uh, so anyway, I will start with a brief background on the system and then on the initiative and then Lisa will provide more information on mission-oriented collateral and mission-oriented organizations. And that will lead into our, the topics of our next panels. So the bank system was created in 1932. Um, it was actually during, it was during the Great Depression, it was actually in the Hoover administration, um, not like many other institutions that were created later. Um, and the focus was really to support the thrift institutions and encourage longer term amortizing mortgages. So in thrift institutions and insurance companies were eligible members at that time. The system currently includes 11 regional federal home loan banks and the Office of Finance. The Office of Finance is a joint office that issues and services the bank debt securities. And the map that you see on the, on the screen uh, shows the location of the banks and, and the headquarters for each bank. And also the stars that you see um, show the location of various roundtables and um, the areas of focus for the virtual roundtables. Actually, this version of, the, oh yeah, I can see the stars, okay. Um, so the eligible member institutions, as I said, were initially thrifts and insurance companies, um, but they now include commercial banks, credit unions, and 
of course, non-depository CDFIs, hence the focus today. That's since 2008, uh, they became eligible. Depository CDFIs are eligible as commercial banks or as credit unions. The system currently has about 6,500 members, of which I believe at le about 40, 74 are non-depository CDFIs, and uh, about 440 are non-depository CDFIs. The primary business of the banks is providing advances to their members, and in their secondary market entity, so these are low-cost loans that must be secured by eligible uh, collateral, and this is set out in um, the parameters are established in statute, um, most of which is housing-related. Other products and services include the acquired member asset programs where in, through which the banks purchase loans, mortgage loans from their members, standby letters of credit and deposit accounts, in addition, the Bank Act requires each bank to offer an affordable housing program through which they must contribute at least 10% of the prior year's net earnings. Uh, wrong button. Okay. The System at 100 review. So back in, in 2022 and 2023, FHFA undertook a comprehensive review of the, of the bank system, and it really was the first uh, review since of probably the 90s that really was all-encompassing. We looked at different issues in between those times, but that was, it was really tried to encompass, you know, a comprehensive look. And as you see here, there's a statement of the, the purpose or focus, and I want to emphasize several points about that. So one is that um, the safety and soundness is necessary. It is not in conflict with the mission, but it is necessary. The provision of safe, stable and reliable funding to creditworthy members is, I would emphasize, the creditworthy. Um, and in addition, the support for housing and community development through their members. So these are all important components of this, of the purpose. So advances are made to members to support housing activities in their communities, as well as AHP is awarded through member applicants to projects, to project sponsors. The, the review was initiated against a backdrop of some concerns about the banks. Um, so if you looked at, if you, if you stepped in at the end of 2021, the bank system advances were at about 351 billion. Um, a year later, the end of 2022, they were over 800 billion. So there's, there's variation because of the, the demand um, for, because of the very support given to individuals and businesses during COVID, the demand for liquidity had dropped markedly during that time period. And so there were fewer earnings maybe to support AHP, but also there were just concerns about the, the system. So turning to the, the System at 100 process. So as part of the System at 100, FHFA held numerous public events and uh, we had lots of opportunities for public input, as outlined here. Um, many of you may have participated in or watched some of the events. Um, it culminated in a report. I've already shown my prop, um, and but maybe I should show it again. Maybe I'll get a laugh this time. <laughs> Aha! It worked. Okay. Um, and but but in all seriousness, the uh, the report is available on the website and is is available for download. Um, and I encourage you to read it because it really out, it really looks forward at what we're trying to do going forward, uh, where the system is and, and where we're going and where, where we as FHFA see this going. So we re the report was issued last November and there are four primary sections. Um, it covers a lot. Um, so I'm only really going to touch a little bit on some of these topics. So one of the core areas that, that it focuses on, or it starts with certainly, is the mission of the system. So um, since the creation of the system, there have been su significant changes in mortgage markets. Um, you know, from, if you go back to 32, when they thought an 8 to 12 year amortizing mortgage was a long-term mortgage, to now in which 
people are looking at 30 years and maybe 20 is not enough in, in certain circumstances, uh, as, at least as came up in an earlier discussion. Um, FHFA heard different, differing views on the mission. So we heard different perspectives. Some people very much emphasized the provision of liquidity of and by itself, whereas others were looking at the whole um, focus on housing and community development, liquidity for housing and community development. So clarifying the mission is really one of these key steps that we see in implementing the report recommendations, and I'll touch more on this in just a moment. Um, the banks also were established to provide, so in the next category is stable and reliable source of liquidity. So the banks were established to provide this to their members, and they have fulfilled this function over their history in the 92 years of existence. Um, and I think it's been particularly important for community-based financial institutions that have limited access to capital markets, but it is also used by other financial institutions. And the recommendations in this area of the report have focused on things like improving liquidity management priorities. The banks are not to be the lender of last resort. Strengthening the bank's management of member credit risk. Strengthening capital, capital management and prioritizing climate risk assessment and climate resiliency. Turning to housing and community development, this is one area we try to focus on increasing support for and focus on housing and community development throughout the bank's business. So this is support for mission-oriented organizations and accepted, acceptance of mission-oriented collateral for advances, which Lisa will be talking about in a few minutes. Uh, Mission-focused advances and the CIP and SICA programs. Um, also, um, increasing the statutory minimum for the affordable housing program, the statutory minimum contribution, and prudent engagement by the banks in pilot and voluntary programs. And when we talk about support for focus on housing and community development, it shouldn't be just off to one side. Yes, it's important to have programs that can offer subsidies where needed, but it's, it's, it's sort of part of the whole program and the whole business is the, and so the more that can be pushed out uh, to support housing and community development through regular programs, then the more that can reserve uh, subsidies for the areas where it's truly needed. And the, appro the, the recommendations in the report follow uh, multiple approaches. So um, where FHFA is con committed to ongoing engagement, I think you heard the director earlier discuss this, um, through events, through requests for input, um, and we anticipate more of those in upcoming months. There are also uh, proposed actions that may include guidance, rulemakings, and ha we had some recommendations for congressional action. Okay. So I turn to this as some key priorities with an emphasis on the sum for 2024. Uh, this is certainly not all of our priorities for 2024. This is sort of a selection, maybe a little bit more of interest to this group, but even it may not encompass all that you might be interested in. Um, so there is a report implementation page on our website, and I encourage you to go there and to kind of keep track of some of the things that we're working on. Um, but as I alluded to earlier, one of, the, one of the key areas we're starting with is clarifying the system mission in the core mission activities regulation um, to make sure that we encompass these, these areas of liquidity and support for housing and community development in an interrelated fashion. Also, we have issued um, a re request for input on core mission activities and mission achievement. And yes, I have another prop. Um, and that is also on our website. Um, and I encourage you, it's been out for about a month, and I encourage you to uh, provide your comments. Um, there is no explicit statement of mission in the Bank Act. Um, but the mission can be infer inferred from other parts of the statute or from other statutory requirements. And so as outlined in that RFI, um, we're seeking input on an updated mission statement, 
measures of mission achievement, and member incentive programs. Um, we're also looking to align member eligibility requirements, including requirements that are applied on an ongoing basis, so that members are continuing to have an, a connection to the mission. Um, we are looking into, we expect to have guidance uh, to address some barriers for non-depository CDFI members. Um, and so we are looking forward to all your input here today. Um, other, other areas include streamlining affordable housing program requirements. And we also expect to hear more, I, I, would, ex I would like you to expect to hear more in the upcoming months about these and other topics, as well as those that Lisa will be discussing. One, one of the other things we have already, um, the agency has already issued an RI on addressing cooperativa membership. Um, as CDFIs and clarifying what is in the, the regulations on that. So I will turn it to Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you, Amy, for the introduction. Um, like Amy, I will be providing a quick update on some of the System 100 um, actions that the Division of Bank Regulation is taking to address the recommendations from the System at 100 report. Specifically, um, I have three avenues to increase the Federal Home Loan Bank's engagement with mission-oriented organizations, actions to enhance pledging of collateral with a strong connection to the, uh, the mission of the Federal Home Loan Bank system, and strengthening member risk management. Uh, similar to uh, the topics that Amy covered for uh, the topic of um, increasing Federal Home Loan Bank's engagement with mission-oriented organizations, FHFA will be releasing a request for input, soliciting public input to assist FHFA in developing a supervisory framework that better positions mission-oriented organizations to help advance the Federal Home Loan Bank's um, mission, including identifying any needed changes to the current FHFA guidance. This request for input would also inform the parameters that the mission-oriented collateral programs should have so we can incentivize members to pledge collateral that is mission-oriented. This request for information uh, will also seek input about the products that better serve mission-oriented organizations and other specific considerations for lending to these institutions. Those are the details that I will provide today that is ongoing and you will hear more about this uh, in the near future. We encourage the public to please provide comments when available to do so. We also have ongoing work on different options for establishing mission-oriented collateral programs. And again, this is to incentivize members to pledge collateral that enhances lending in supporting of housing and community development. Finally, the Division of Bank Regulation completed a draft of the member credit uh, management guidelines. This advisory bulletin provides uh, guidance to the Federal Home Loan Banks on ensuring a sound member credit risk management framework. It is intended to memorialize FHFA's long-standing expectation that the Federal Home Loan Bank's underwriting and credit decisions should reflect the member's financial condition and not rely solely on collateral securing their credit obligations. That's all I have for today. Oh, sorry, I forgot to. I didn't have that many, so. Apologies about that. Uh, do we have some minutes for questions? Okay. Rebecca? Oh, we have a minute. Oh, okay, sorry. Any questions? Hello, Peggy Delanois Hamilton, Federal Home Loan Bank of Pittsburgh. Um, you mentioned an advisory bulletin. Um, when is when do, can we expect that? 
was that? Very, very soon. soon. <laughs> it's coming. I know you have heard me say that before. Yeah, uh, Dave Porterfield, uh, the Advisory Council of Federal Home Bank of Chicago. Um, I'm curious, you know, you're going through the, uh, basically the, looking at the, um, the mission of the system, it looks like. Do you expect that then the um, individual banks will um, create their own mission based on that or just follow that mission? I'm just curious, the procedure, what you're thinking about that. Thank you. Um, I think it's setting forth the mission for the system, so that would be that would apply to all. It's going to be it would be in a regulation, just like the existing mission statement is in a regulation. Yeah. Hi, um, Doug Bistry with Clearinghouse CDFI. Um, I've heard some talk about uh, gathering data points for safety and soundness, which I understand the banks do as well as FHFA. Has there been any thought to gathering data on members? own impact of housing and community development, not through your programs, but on their own and tracking that, since it's part of your mission. I think there's a certain amount that happens through the uh, like uh, requirements for community support, but I think that's, that's more, there are more narrowly targeted re requirements, but, that, but this is something we could, we could consider. Hi, uh, Todd Hollander, uh, Lendistry, uh, member of the Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco. Uh, I've, I've heard a lot of uh, conflicting information about why you can't take uh, SBA uh, 504s and 70s as collateral. Uh, that would uh, sure give us some much needed capital if we could utilize the FHLB for that. Uh, can you shed some light? I probably can at this moment or in this space, but I invite you to provide comments on the request for input because that's the kind of information that we are looking to learn from the public, specific collateral and specific characteristics of the collateral that might help with the mission. Thank you. Thank you again, Amy and Lisa. And now it's time for the panel I'm sure many of you have all been waiting for. As many questions have been cued and prefaced and preambled. <laughs> so uh, as our next panel is getting ready to take, or as they take their seats in, um, getting ready for our next panel. I'll just uh, introduce the next panel, which is uh, entitled Insights on Mission-Oriented Collateral. So without further ado. Thank you, LaRonda. So it's been the hot topic already, so I anticipate there will probably be a lot of questions. So we're, we've got a fully packed uh, agenda um, we're going to try and cover three topics, uh, mission-oriented collateral, uh, leveraging pilots in the collateral space, um, and then we'll do a little bit of a discussion with low-income housing tax credits. Um, so we have three individuals joining us to talk about these topics today, um, and they'd like to just give a quick little intro to kind of explain their expertise to be on this panel. So. Sure, so um, I'm Christopher Blair with the Camilla Trust, and we are not Aries rated, <laughs> so, but we do support um, the general kind of um, getting uh, data aggregated together similarly. But um, I think I wanted to mention kind of who we are so you understand where I, I kind of come from. We are a CDFI that's focused on um, creating and preserving affordable housing. Um, we have 40,000 units in our debt and equity programs in 42 states as well as District of Columbia, Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. Um, we we um, have, um, since our inception 25 years ago, have originated or purchased on the secondary market 415 affordable housing loans, 
totaling over $950 million, and 95% of those have been loans on low-income tax credit properties. Um, the partial premise of our founding was to be alternative to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and providing unfunded Ford commitments and secondary market purchases of light, uh, on loans on light, light tech properties. Um, obviously, 25 years, things have changed in the market, and our premise, our, uh, but our founding premise kind of remains with us today. We have been a member of the Federal Home Loan Bank of New York since 2013, and in aggregate have taken 213 million of advances um, since we started our first um, borrowing in 2017. So I look forward to the discussion today. I think CD, um, CDFIs are really partners in the system since we all have um, really expertise in developing financial products. Good afternoon, Sean Mulroy with the Federal Home Loan Bank of Chicago. I currently manage our member credit teams responsible for the financial underwriting of our members, banks, credit unions, CDFIs. Um, prior to that role, I was uh, head of our collateral valuation and haircuts team, so I can talk about both sides of the coin. And hi, I'm Cindy Holler. I'm the CEO of Community Housing Capital, which is based in Atlanta. Um, we are a 25-year-old uh, CDFI. Uh, we are rated uh, by got rated both by S&P and Fitch, um, and high investment grade, I may add. Um, we also um, are, have been members of the Federal Home Loan Bank of Atlanta, proud members, by the way, since uh, 2008. And um, we have taken $14 million worth of advances from the, the bank and have deployed about $5 million worth of AHP grants. So we continue to explore uh, with that team, a lot of great programs that they can offer, and we continue to march down and try to figure out how to use them. Um, so, Thank you. So we're going to kick it off with the first topic, which is mission-oriented collateral. Um, so at a high level, um, we're going to kind of go around and have each of you talk about what does mission-oriented collateral mean to you? And I think, Cindy, you want to kick it off? Uh, sure. Happy to. Um, you know, I, I repondered that question again last night um, in preparing for this. And, you know, if affordable housing and community development is our mission, um, then we really have to consider sort of all asset classes on the, in this. And, and Christopher and I talked, and he's going to focus a little more on multifamily. I'm going to talk a little bit more about single family, which, by the way, is about 70% of the assets that are in the United States are single family assets, right? So uh, I think if we're going to do community development, we really need to look at all asset classes, but particularly single family. And, you know, um, so what does mission-based collateral mean for me? I hate the word um, low-income communities. I like to think of it more like emerging markets, okay? Um, and the two high, if you're a member, by the way, of HPN, the Housing Partnership Network, or the NeighborWorks Network, could you raise your hand, please? Just take a look. There's a reason that we all know each other, okay? We're part of those two networks. They're n nationwide networks. They're, they're basically small community development businesses that are trying to change neighborhoods. And they work in emergency, emerging markets. And almost all of them have not only a development arm, but also a, a community development financial institution that's associated with them that originate, originates mortgages to first-time home, homeowners um, in emerging markets where the credit scores are probably going to be lower than you would like. Um, uh, but we have found, as these two networks, that the losses that these CDFIs experience are very, very low, very low. And, and we need to get that word out to you all because I think we can be, as CDFIs, sort of the retail to those folks. So if you ask me what mission-oriented um, capital or collateral looks like, I think there are some real uh, opportunities to take um, some, uh, this, uh, to look at this uh, um, AMA, guys, say it with me. It is the Acquired Member Members Asset Program. <laughs> And, and really put that to work in our communities, okay? It's, some of the banks are doing it now. I think we could do, be doing more of it. Um, I think that we could be using unsecured lines of credit to CDFIs 
to do warehouse lines of credit to some of our, our, our members. Uh, Dan Ellis is sitting over here. He's a developer at NHS of Baltimore. He has changed West Baltimore. Go up and see it. Um, by uh, rehabbing uh, homes there, um, using our money. And, um, but he constantly runs out of money when he's trying to originate mortgage, mortgages to the home, home owners. So how do we combine some of these programs that, that are targeting emerging markets, creating community development, and can, let's relook as a system in the federal home loan bank system about how to make those consistent with the people that are living in those neighborhoods, not necessarily what the, what the you know, highest, uh, uh, highest and best credit standard is, right? Let's look at that. That's what mission-oriented collateral is. And I think the CDFIs can actually help the other member banks get there. So that's my too long response, but there you <laughs> well, go. Thank you. No, I appreciate it. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I'll take this more. My comments will be really targeted to multifamily affordable housing. Um, but I would say in multifamily, I think many of you know it, the, it's really divided between capital A affordable and um, lowercase or little a affordable. Um, capital A affordable is generally defined as properties with regulatory agreements restricting units or to households making 60% AMI or below. There's many different programs, but the most common are project-based Section 8 and long housing tax credit. Little a or lowercase affordable um, is a little bit more of an open-ended definition, but it's generally thought of as naturally occurring affordable housing um, to residents making 60% AMI or below in, in the multifamily space. Um, I do think that the federal home loan bank system should support both, but really should really target capital A affordable housing types, um, at loan types, collateral types at first. Um, it's an easier definable definition it's also more consistent performance data, and there's, it's also a large enough market in its own right. There's over three million units under regulatory agreements in the LIHTC program or project-based Section 8, and there's other programs beyond that. Um, I also think that we're gonna talk about loans on probably more standard 9% transactions later, but CDT, we've mentioned a number of different um, um, collateral types that in affordable house, multifamily affordable housing, we think should be um, eligible collateral throughout the system. And we were surprised wasn't. Um, the first is unrated private placement tax exempt bonds on 4% LIHTC projects. When LIHTC is discussed, it's, pre it's pretty much discussed both as, as of right, 4% LIHTC credits with tax exempt bonds and then competitive 9% credits with taxable mortgages. In a given year, it can vary, but in generally, half the LIHTC um, units created are under each program. Um, and the collateral is the same with the first mortgage, um, except obviously legal documentation with a tax exempt bond is much different. Um, I, I think um, um, it, there's actually even more secondary market information on 4% tax exempt bonds, since it's a much larger market. Um, it's a little hard to find some for certain data, but it's generally thought to be three times as, the permanent tax exempt bond market is over three times as large as the loan market and 9% and transactions. And the bond sizes are just about the same. And we'll talk a little bit later on, but typically 9% loans, when they're sold, they're sold in, sold in pools, and 4% bonds have been sold individually. So there's just more data on it. The second um, that I, collateral type that I was still surprised wasn't always eligible is second mortgages on multi family affordable housing projects throughout all the banks. I know some banks permit um, second mortgages on multifamily, but prohibit CDFI members for pledging such, and there's growing capital gaps in affordable housing that you probably all hear. Um, and commercial banks have difficulty providing second mortgage, particularly the larger ones, due to capital charges. So I think that the CDFIs could work together and kind of derail create a credit parameters or credit box for second mortgages. Although I do acknowledge the secondary market information is more limited on secondary on second mortgages and the valuations are much more nuanced than first mortgages. Thanks, Christopher. Sean, uh, add in? Maybe a little shorter. Um, so the Chicago Bank approach is, is generally one that is all encompassing uh, of, of both aspects of the mission, right? To provide reliable liquidity to support affordable housing and community development. I think those concepts are not mutually exclusive. And fundamentally, we view mission-oriented collateral as all acceptable collateral that is, is pledged to us, whether that be uh, T-bills or low-income housing tax credit uh, loans. I think in Chicago, we endeavor 
to provide a, a broad suite of collateral in which members can lever against. Um, and we're constantly learning. I think we can maybe jump into some of the valuation considerations later on, but our philosophy is, is all encompassing. Thank you. So for kind of a, I guess another big question in this space is, so what can FHFA do to help um, in, this, in this mission oriented collateral space? Cindy? Uh, well, one thing, we've got to say it guys, right? Put, a, put the banks and the CDFIs in the room and let us figure out how to standardize you know, the haircuts on collateral. They're not even, okay? <laughs> and they're not in single family space, they're not in the multifamily space. And I would not try to, you know, impose a regulation on it right away, but let's force us all to get in the room and really talk about it, okay? With real data, okay? I think it would help a lot. And, um, because we've really been doing a lot of surveying about how different those haircuts are, and uh, it's reflective of some biases of our industry. So that's one thing. Um, I think also, I think it's really important to um, really think about publicizing some of the successes out there. Um, and let's do that together so that it doesn't look like it's just publicity for one or the other. Um, so I'm gonna defer to my colleagues on some other things that they might want. Christopher? Sure, I would just start with today, more affordable housing knowledge um, in the system, at the, at particularly the collateral departments of, of the Federal Home Loan Banks, but as well as the, the field examiners of FHA. I think that would help create some collateral to programs. But just as importantly, the treatment of collateral is almost as important, um, because we can talk all day long about mission-oriented collateral, but if we can't improve the treatment, and that's higher base margins, lower haircuts, however you want to define it, and also better better mark-to-market treatment, it will not make sense for members to pledge such collateral. So those are really the two big points. And other, just to focus also on federal home loan banks maybe, on collateral programs, I think there's, grants are great, low subsidized advances are, are impactful, but the core of the federal bank system is collateral, and I think we, we really need as a system to kind of improve it. Thanks, Christopher. Sean, do you have anything you wanna yeah, add? Yeah, I think that's, I, I would echo both of these points, and I think there's a lot of salience to, to both of them. Um, I think kind of the togetherment that we're having here and trying to solution some of these issues is, is, is wildly beneficial. Um, again, I, I, I would welcome, I think, the work that the agency is doing with the, the RFI and mission-oriented collateral will help to spell out uh, a, a path towards what Cardinal North should look like for many of the home loan banks. Um, I would, you know, I, I don't want to you know, skirt the issue. I want to acknowledge that there is a difference in approaches across home loan banks. I obviously can't speak to their collateral practices, um, but I think the information sharing uh, between not only the FHFA, the home loan banks, as well as the CDFI members in which we support um, to be really beneficial. And, you know, I, Christopher and I have been maybe talking through the LIHTC issue for about a year now. I think we're making some substantive process in that arena. Um, but a lot of that has been information sharing. You know, Christopher is educating me on some issues that I was unaware of or not privy to. And I think, I hope that, you know, I've been able to educate you and, and even the, the examiners that, that come into the office on some of the, the complexities and nuance of not only the deals we see, um, but how do we navigate some of the regulatory nuance. I think the RFI is a good first step. Um, but in certain areas, we potentially need uh, additional guidance on, on uh, latitude in which we can operate. Could I? Could yeah, go I, ahead. Could I build on that? Because I, I, I think that's a really important point. Um, you know, we're a national C CDFI. We lend to 240 neighbor works organizations around the country. Um, so we're really the retail, okay? <laughs> and, and, and the federal home loan bank system, I feel like, is the wholesale. And if we could work with, with in, a, in a very cooperative way with the other members we can use the networks I just pointed out to get the money out to the ground where capital doesn't go, okay? There's gotta be some standards up here. We can do the funky stuff, but that only happens if we're really talking to each other in forums like this, and I'm really, really hoping that this doesn't stop, right? We've gotta go back to our banks like Atlanta has done and bring everybody together um, with the CEO and sit down and say, we're gonna make something happen here. That's gotta happen. Thanks, Cindy. So. 
Um, switching to kind of the, the second topic, uh, leveraging pilots. So FHFA issued um, an advisory bulletin in November of last year, which provides guidance to the banks about our FHFA's expectation um, about establishing a framework for essentially setting up pilot programs. Um, so I will say one important note to highlight with respect to pilot programs is that each one must conform to applicable statutory, regulatory, or other legal authorities. But in this section, we wanted to kind of focus discussion kind of as ideas um, for potentially leveraging pilots um, in the context of the collateral space. So, you know, where, where can we potentially use pilots um, to, to try things out? So, Sean, we're going to start with you this time, kind of talk about it from uh, the FHL Bank of Chicago perspective. Yeah, and I think uh, I'll start my points kind of off of my previous comment of I think the guidance that was provided in the AB on pilots has been super beneficial to the home loan banks and our ability to really rethink some of the issues um, that many of our CDFI members have with respect to collateral and how we can meet the unmet demand in an innovative way. Um, so, you know, FHFA has, has detailed for us a nice playbook by which we can follow, and we are now moving with gusto and trying to support some of these pilots, specifically in the, the LIHTC space, um, and then as we look further into advanced solutions as well, um, it really has been uh, a positive effort on, on our end and how we are thinking about and, and really giving us the latitude that I described to innovate in ways. So we're, we're pretty excited about it. So, Cindy, I think you had a couple ideas. Yeah, you a couple, to... couple of thoughts. Um, first of all, um, I know this is the collateral panel. I get that. But I think if we combine some unsecured lending with some collateral lending, we could be really, really powerful. I think we should be um, lifting up the work that uh, the Chicago and Dallas Bank did on the Canopy program and the Community First program, OK? That is unsecured capital going to the CDFIs so we can imagine collateral type programs with our customers. But we need that capital to be unsecured, okay? So, and, and the Atlanta Bank has been working with us on this idea and, and tossing it around with their senior leadership, and thank you. Um, underneath that, if you give me an unsecured line of credit so that I can lend to the 81 CDFIs that are part of the NeighborWorks network, um, they're gonna originate mortgages with it, okay? And I'm gonna bring those mortgages in, and then maybe we can start using the acquired um, uh, members asset program to get it off their books and revolve it. So let's, this is where grants stop at the moment that you give them out, right? This is a way to kind of complete the system and revolve that capital all around the United States. So that, to me, um, I, and, and as we discussed with the, the Atlanta Bank, you know, we can't do 25 pilots, okay? We're going to have to pick a couple. And maybe each bank picks a couple and we learn from each other because you can't do R&D all over the place. And that was very wise. So, so let's sit down and figure out what makes the most sense for that bank and then definitely compare notes. Yeah, definitely one of the yeah. key parts of the pilots is what, do we, what can we learn for, from the the implementation of them. So Christopher? Yeah, um, I would encourage everybody to read the CDFI working group letter that went out last week that has um, information on pilots as just well as collateral. So I want to give a shout out to that. Um, and, and Joe Neri, who led that. So um, um, I do think the two pilots that interest me is the ways to use retained earnings above kind of statutory HP contributions to kind of collateralize pilots in some first loss position. What particularly interests me that I think um, what we, that Cindy kind of hit on is the way to recycle that capital um, I think would be very meaningful because my expectation if affordable housing pilots are done correctly, you'll find that the system will not lose money um, and, that, and that, that capital will grow. I think second of all, um, I think AMA programs could be very impactful in expanding them to multifamily affordable housing. Um, if, um, there's 
I read the Federal Reserve Bank of New York put out a study and showed that uh, CDFIs, including depository CDFIs, originated $8 billion of multifamily loans in 2022. Um, what particularly interests me in AMA, and I think the structures that have been talked about, is where um, selling members would retain kind of a top loss or B piece or some credit enhancement um, in those loans. And I think that would, one, protect um, the federal home loan banks, but second of all, it could put some asset management functions on, on the, the multifamily loans that I'm not really sure the federal home loan bank system has the, really the capacity or the expertise right now. Um, but I want to end on one thing. I want to be clear on what pilots are and what our desired outcomes are before we really dive in as a system. So the pilot a definition is an initial trial that helps an organization learn how a large-scale project might work in practice. This, I want to be clear that a goal of a pilot is not a one-and-done program but something that should be made more permanent and larger if it is successful. Amen. Yeah, yeah. and I, I would agree that would be the goal is, right, this is the, the testing of, of, of the ideas to see what works and what, and what works well, what doesn't work as well. Um, I know you've, you've kind of touched on this a little bit already, um, but in the space of leveraging pilots, um, is there anything we want to add about what FHFA can do to help? OK, so this is a compliment, and it, but it's not going to sound like one. Um, <laughs> just be clear about that, OK? Um, I never want to have this meeting again, never. Because the next time we get together, we should have done something, OK? So let's take the reports, the ideas, let's get in rooms, let's hash it out and make something happen. Um, so help us move it along. Well, I think the director was very clear this morning what her expectations were. On I heard that, and I'm affirming that. <laughs> so yeah, I, we heard that as well. So uh, um, Christopher, Sean, anything you want to add at this point? Yeah, I would, I would maybe, again, echo Cindy's points, but um, kind of bringing things maybe back to the Community First Fund in a way, which was maybe the pilot program before the pilot program uh, was originally incepted. Um, and for those who maybe don't know, the Community First Fund has been in operation for a decade at this point. We've incurred zero credit losses, um, and it's been wildly impactful, um, not only to our organization and understanding CDFI's business models, but also to the CDFI's in which we are serving through that program. Um, and I would encourage uh, all home loan banks, as well as the agency, to be willful uh, participants to engage on similar pilot programs. Um, just given the knowledge that we have in the Chicago Bank and how meaningful and impactful that program has been. Sure, so I'll add just two points. Um, I think that FHFA could encourage the federal home banks to leverage off each other in pilots. Um, the ideal pilot for me, for collateral pilot, is where many federal home loan banks would come together to create more of a national and larger scale pilot. But if that can't happen, at minimum, the federal banks share data learned on their pilots to other federal banks. So the other federal banks do not have to start from scratch and could even create maybe permanent collateral programs off lessons learned and data from other federal home loan banks. Um, and I also want to make a comment, and I'm not sure this really has to do with pilots, but just a general comment on collateral in the system. Collateral, affordable housing collateral systems should be treated very similar, if not uniform, across the banks. And there's really no reason affordable housing collateral is treated so disparately by bank to bank, because the national performance and valuations are very similar. And I think that we should really understand as a system that we're only as strong as our least impactful federal home loan bank. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you all sharing your ideas and thoughts of what we can do in this space. So. Um, we're going to move to our, our third and last topic before we get to we open it up for Q&A. Um, and so we're going to talk about low income housing tax credit multifamily loans. I know this is probably a favorite topic of many people in this room, and they've had many conversations about it um, over the past months or even years. Um, so uh, one thing I do want to know is when we are talking about the low income housing tax credit multifamily loans, we're not actually talking about just a CDFI specific issue, right? This is a uh, issue for other members of the federal home loan banks as well, because um, this is collateral that they would all also potentially have to pledge. 
So Christopher, I think you're going to kick us off talking kind of about the your experience in the in the lie tech market. We, I live on this daily, but um, <laughs> so, but I do want to give a couple data points um, that there really is no other affordable housing multifamily program that comes near the impact of lie tech, um, with approximately 100 or nearly 100,000 units created or preserved annually under the program. Um, to give a sense in multifamily, tw approximately over the past 20 years, approximately 20% of the new multifamily units developed have been through the LIHTC program. It's really low-hanging fruit in the, low income, in, in the federal home loan system to improve the treatment of loans on LIHTC properties. Um, there's a significant amount of performance data since the program began in 1986. All sources I've seen point to light tech loan collateral being one of, if not the most secure real estate investment, not even affordable housing, real estate investment um, at loan type out there. Um, Cone Resnick puts out um, a pretty well regarded um, biannual performance study on tax credit properties. Um, it has a lot of data in it, and I encourage anyone who has not seen that to look at it. But in the report, it shows that the cumulative foreclosure rate on um, loans on long-term tax credit properties is 50 basis points since the program inception, and there were no foreclosures noted in 2021 and 22 in the entire program. Um, there's many reasons for this, but one data metric I would say is the permanent loan to cost on 9% light tech properties in most of the country is in the 20 to 30% range. And in higher barrier entry markets, sometimes that percentage is even lower. Um, CDT, my firm, we have a 25 year track record lending on light tech properties. Um, our low average size is a little bit below the average size in the program, which one would think maybe that's more risky, but that if you really understand the program, that's actually actually not the case. Um, last year, we had to, it was the first year we had to book a general loan loss reserve on our portfolio of loans. Um, and it re required us to go back and look at 24 years of history on our credit performance. Um, also look at some market data. And Cone Resnick is also our auditor that helped. And the conclusion was on 202 loans in our portfolio, all but four of them are li were LIHTC, totaling 498 million. Our auditor supported a lo general loan loss reserve of 568,000 or 11 basis points. Um, so even, I do want to mention that foreclosures in the program is always a concern, um, but there's very few of them, but the ones that have, you can actually have pretty substantial recoveries. Um, we are in the process of forec foreclosing, on our first foreclosure in nearly a decade, it's a 34-unit um, property in Little Rock, Arkansas, 15 years in, small sponsor, key principal, passed away, spouse couldn't really operate the business, um, and, the, and the loan really has a negative DCR. Think about negative DCR, negative NOI. We're, it's been a long foreclosure process. I won't say foreclosure process does not take long, it does. But we are at the end of it and expect in the next month, maybe two months how these things go, to have a full recovery. When I say full recovery, principal interest, default interest, small prepayment ability, and all fees paid on that loan. And we could actually make a significant amount more money on that if we wanted to take away the affordability restrictions that the lender can. However, we have a mission, and we're going to keep it affordable as long as we're just made financially whole. So that gives a case of where you have probably a worse performing loan with a negative DCR that you can actually have a full recovery. Obviously, that's pan out in the next month, so I'll be in trouble if it doesn't. But, um, but, I, um, but I wanted to mention that. But I know that's just credit characteristics. I also want to talk about the investor interest in LIHTC loan collateral. Um, LIHTC loan collateral has a lot of features, but two features that market rate loan collateral doesn't have is there's a lot of mission-based capital out there these days, and there's also CRA, CRA needs from banks. So in addition to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's significant involvement in loans on loans and tax credit properties, you also have private investors, banks, insurance companies, and pension funds that are all in the new origination as well as been in the historical secondary market. As I mentioned, CDT is also in the new origination, but we also in the secondary market. We've purchased over 80 lo LIHTC loans since our inception. The issue over the past 10 years is people figured out this is a great collateral and they don't really want to sell it. 
Um, and you also had, in the past 10 years, the CDFI Bond Guarantee Fund has come out. It's issued $2.5 billion of bonds to CDFIs. And a portion of that has been collateralized by multi affordable multifamily. And a portion with that, I think a good amount has been Litec loan because it matches well with the bonds. And that's really allowed CDFIs to retain loans on their balance sheet that they might have historically had to sell. And you also have Freddie Mac has really improved its secondary market platform for Litec loans. Um, in the past seven years, they've taken 5.9 billion of secondary Litec bonds through their MDL structure, um, and a billion and 60 of taxable 9% loans through their QDL structure, and that's the past 10 years. So there's a significant amount of investor interest. There's a strong, it has a very strong credit parameters, and it also has really, it's institutional quality loan collateral, because you have institutions in the ownership, Litec ownership structure, and remember, these are all substantially rehabilitated, or a lot of times new constructed properties, and one would expect that the system would treat this as the gold standard, the best collateral, with higher base margins and better mark-to-market -market treatment, and that's not been the case to date, but it will need to be the case if we want to get more Litec loan collateral in the system. Thanks, Christopher. So, Sean, turning to you, can you kind of talk about from the Federal Home Loan Bank perspective about how how you deal with uh, collateral specific and specifically the Litec? Yeah, and this is maybe where I lose the room. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, I one hundred. I want to be forthright about the performance aspects of Litec. Litec performs well. There, there really is not much debate nor concern on my end uh, about how well these assets perform. Um, one thing that I do want to clarify, um, at least in the Chicago Bank approach, and again, I cannot speak to the other home loan banks' approach to valuing this, um, we assign the same haircuts that we would to any other member. If a bank is pledging us slide tech loans, they're going to receive the same margin as a CDFI would, as an insurance company would. Um, but the scenario in which we are managing to internally is more a function of the liquidity piece, and that's secondary market uh, liquidity. And one of the reasons that Chicago maybe has a more informed opinion on it, we're, we're currently, uh, we assign a 15% discount on top of our multifamily haircuts for litec specific collateral. Um, and the reason we've done that is there's a couple of reasons. One, um, we do have a concentration of these assets. I think some of the other home loan banks that might not have a concentration of these assets haven't fully endeavored to contemplate the structure or really, you know, there hasn't been a demand from the membership, so they've been agnostic to it in ways. Chicago, we have a generally formed opinion, I think it's evolving. Um, and uh, the, the liquidity piece, I, I do want to kind of hit on this. Um, to Christopher's point, the asset performs so well that price discovery in secondary markets is uh, challenging to ascertain. And part of the guidance that we have received from the FHFA is that we need to account for liquidation costs. And the base assumption is that we are going to have to sell this asset in a stress scenario um, and that our haircut should be sufficient to cover all of the liquidation costs, all of the market risk, um, and any other idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic factors that we determine to be salient in the evaluation of that asset. I think, again, we welcome the opportunity to leverage pilots in a new way to support this asset class, because in my humble opinion, for what it's worth, I do believe that these are transformative assets in the affordable housing space um, and should be something that we, we continue to support. Um, again, though, uh, the, the performance piece, I would say, is more closely associated with eligibility, right? And beyond that, you know, is, is it performing, is it not? Eligibility, binary, yes or no. The liquidity piece is what really drives some of the, the haircut, at least at the Home Loan Bank of Chicago, um, and how we think about evaluating it further. Um, the valuation treatment, uh, you know, we, we could talk about that. We, Christopher and I were joking. We could have a whole day's symposium on, on how we value these, treat these, mark them, et cetera. Price is price. It tells me something. It doesn't tell me everything. I think we've made some, you know, we make some adjustments on pricing uh, assumptions given the strong credit performance of the asset, um, but it really is is not substantive enough to kind of overcome some of the hurdles that CDFIs uh, uh, face and need for us to address and continue to support this asset more holistically. And you know, a, a long way of saying, you know, I, I think there are challenges for sure. Um, I don't want to skirt them. Um, 
but it is, is something that, that I think we can manage, and some of which comes back to maybe a more philosophical approach to risk and what risk means. Um, you know, risk does not mean, oh, we should not do something. Um, we all, everybody in this room manages risk on a day-to-day -day basis. Not all risks are created equal, and our approach to managing risks needs to be dynamic. Um, and I think LIHTC and uh, kind of how we're working to, to support it more holistically at the Chicago Bank is a prime example of how we're rethinking some of these risk management frameworks to not only appeal to some of the safety and soundness concerns um, from the regulatory side, but also to meet that unmet demand on the, the CDFI uh, side to, to ensure that we can uh, uh, continue to support this collateral because ultimately, right, there is an advance on the other side of this asset. And our mandate is to incur zero credit losses. So we, we kind of got to get it right in a lot of ways. Um, but we're excited and we welcome the opportunity to continue to collaborate not only with us on the panel, but everybody in the room on how we can make that a reality. So one thing that kind of occurs to me hearing both of you talk about the liquidity piece, right, the secondary market, um, is that maybe we need to think about a conversation about a little more nuanced view of is it a demand or a supply issue um, in the secondary market for liquidity, right? It's not a lack of, generally it's, it's the lack of price discovery, right? You don't have people that want to buy it, but hearing both of you talk, it's more about nobody wants to sell it. Yeah, I wouldn't even say that nobody wants to buy it. There, there would be buyers. Yeah, that's what I mean. In this case, it's not, there's but no Nobody buyers. wants to sell it. It yeah. performs so well. It's really core to the mission. And I'll let Christopher make yeah, I mean, to that. C CDT, we're very interested in buying secondary market, but there's been very few secondary market sales. Um, there's been some consortia that have sold kind of to their members. Um, but I think that you've seen that people, do, as I mentioned, don't want to relinquish themselves of this good quality collateral. What's always confusing me on the system is, other than the longer terms, because LIHTC loans are typically the standards 18-year terms, never shorter than 15, some are 30, you should have the same buyers for a market rate loan collateral. So that should be the baseline. And then it should be, it, but it has all these other characteristics should, that should make it stronger. But, that's, but it seems that's not the way the system really looks at it, or can, can or does. Cindy, was there anything you wanted to, to chime in with? I, 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 I really agree with this conversation. I, I would just say we even see some bias against LIHTC when we're just pledging it as collateral on an advance that we're guaranteeing, okay? And I, I, I think there's still a misunderstanding um, system-wide about what the low-income housing tax credit program is. And, um, and People get, I still feel like people are getting tripped up by the word low income, okay? So uh, um, so I think there's still more work to be done. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Well, thank you. We're coming up in about 11 minutes left of the panel, so I think let's open it up for questions. Yeah, uh, in the front here. Yeah, Dave Porterfield. Uh, Chicago Bank um, uh, uh, Chair of the Advisory Council. Uh, Sean, you said uh, that there can be no risk or zero loss, I think that's what you said. I, why is that? I mean, it seems like every business that I know of budgets for loss. Is, it, it's a, is this a federal requirement that could be changed? I mean, if it was, if you budgeted for it, you would have something there to, to absorb it if it needed to be. Is, what's the reason for that? So uh, again, you know, coming out of 1932, um, the home loan banks in all of our history, we have never incurred a secured credit loss. Secured being the key phrase there. Um, we take losses on, on other things. Um, one of the, the ongoing kind of standards, whether it be cultural, regulatory driven, is the expectation is that we are not to incur a secured credit loss. And part of the, the way that we manage that is through the credit underwriting piece that Michael was speaking about earlier, um, as well as the collateral practices to ensure that, that you know, we, we have a, a, a margin uh, against all the dollars that go out the door and that the, the assets are fully secured, or securing that advance, excuse me. So when you say there's a margin, there is a margin somewhere in the budget for some loss, is that? We do not. Uh, okay. We do not uh, have a reserve for advances. Okay, 
that's what I need to know. Thank you. Yeah. We've got a question in the back. Sean, quick question. Uh, Tony Lopez, uh, Rosa Development Fund. So when a CDFI pledges collateral to the bank, it's usually on an LTV of 80% or less. And then you do another haircut of 30%. So that's putting your uh, collateral or your risk at basically 50%. Are you saying that that's that, there's that much risk on a transaction that you need a 50% haircut on the overall transaction to feel that there won't be any risk on the overall transaction? So just so maybe let me ask a clarifying question just so I'm understanding your example. You're, you've lent out 30 uh, or a loan 30% LTV and uh, then you pledge that to us. Mm -hmm. We assign a 80% margin to it. Correct. Yeah. How the conjecture. So, right, the the piece of collateral in and of itself is the loan. We we're perfecting our security interest in the loan. Um, we have no desire to foreclose on that loan and seize the underlying collateral. And in a liquidation scenario, we are going to be looking to sell just that loan. So, just your thirty percent of the value of the underlying collateral. So, we're generally agnostic um, to the LTV. It, might, you know, high LTV loans might, in some instances at the Chicago Bank, incur an additional discount. Um, but the, the margin in and of itself is to account for the liquidation risk, the volatility around market price, um, and any brokerage fees that we could incur selling that collateral in the event of a default. Does that answer your question? Uh, Summit Advani, uh, Treasurer Low Income Investment Fund. You talked about all your collateral being pledged. What if we reboat it with you instead? Would that give you that, like, that allows you, if there's a liquidation on the CD, CDFI, to actually have the collateral a lot quicker, liquidate it a lot faster? I, I, I wish I could answer your question better than I probably can. I don't believe I have an informed opinion on rehypothecating collateral to us. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I probably have to talk to somebody in OGC legal to uh, make a determination about the feasibility of that. We have a question from the online community. Um, one of the question is is about FDIC's deposit insurance fund, um, and could the FHFA consider establishing a backstop loan fund? with funds from interest held in the bank's retained earnings, which are ring-fenced. I'm not sure if this is a question for Marianne or for the panelists to weigh in on. Yeah, so essentially FH, asking the question is, should FH, can FHFA establish a, a fund similar to FDIC as a backstop? Um, I'd have to consult with uh, Joshua back there and uh, OGC to opine on that. <laughs> so I, 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 my guess is no. Yeah. Over on the far end. Is this on? But you could encourage the federal home loan banks with the interest on their retained earnings to set that up, probably and would be really helpful if FHA isn't setting it up, but there's voluntary money and retained earnings in each of the federal home loan banks, and they wanted to set up an, a reserve or an insurance, because there are some federal home loan banks that are thinking of things like that. And encouragement from their regulators would probably go a long way. Yeah, so if I'm uh, hearing you correctly, um, more of a direct encouragement is your suggestion to the federal home loan banks from FHFA. Hi, uh, yes. Doug Vistry with Clearinghouse CDFI again. Um, I, I've kind of been confused about um, the role, be it formal or informal, between the FDIC bank insurance fund and the federal home loan banks. Would, would one of you care to explain exactly what that relationship is? I can give you a 
maybe a high level overview, but uh, our relationship with the FDIC is, is maybe twofold. Um, they're obviously the prudential regulator for many of our depository institutions, so we interface with them for points that Michael raised earlier about regulatory exams and any member credit related concerns. Um, in a liquidation scenario, um, obviously we have much more experience in dealing with bank failures than we do with CDFI failures or insurance companies. Um, the, the takeout has usually been and this is not necessarily to say that this would be the circumstances in all cases, um, but uh, in almost all instances, I, somebody might need to fact check me, I believe in all instances for a bank failure, the FDIC will repay our advances as we relinquish our lien against the collateral that was securing those advances. And then the FDIC in their capacity could look to liquidate that collateral on their own, take it and do, do what they will to try to protect the insurance fund. Um, but that is the nature of, of our relationship with the FDIC. That's not a formal agreement or is it formal? There is no formal agreement to my knowledge. Thank you. So my question is for Marianne. Yes. Um, so we have two panelists, multi other people have asked this question and a, and a bank stating that we really need to get in a room and work this out together. How does that happen? So, um, Joshua's going to chime in. Yeah, so I think partially you <laughs> you are in the starting of that right now. We're in the room. Uh, so I think that we've been in the room once before. We're in the room again. I, I think that we're at a point now where the agency is has pulled everyone together here because we think that we need to make progress. Uh, it's not just from our perspective. It's from the, the bank's perspective and the CDFI's perspective. I think we all are in agreement on that right now. Uh, that this is a topic where we can find ways to improve the relationships and find uh, uh, points of, of improvement. Uh, so I think that the, the, the path moving forward is the continued uh, relationship of, of individual CDFIs with their individual banks, but it's with the banks across the board working together uh, and with the FHFA to make sure that we all come to a common understanding of how some of these things should be treated. Uh, because I think that uh, obviously the FHFA has been uh, a part of the history of where we are, uh, uh, be that the, the more conservative treatment on some of these things. Uh, and we, we also think that we have to be part of the solution for it. Uh, that said, I will always caveat everything with we always have to do everything in a safe and sound manner. And I'm going to sit back down. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And I would just add, and particularly in the, the LIHTC space, um, you know, we have an ongoing um, kind of project that we're working on internally, and we've been talking with uh, specific individuals who have expertise in that space, um, internally, externally, with some of the banks, some of the, the, the CDFIs, um, to kind of help inform kind of um, that project. Marianne, with that, is there any thought of a safe harbor provision on certain types of collateral, including LIHTC? Just in dis so I'd say everything is on the table for discussion. Um, we have not made any determinations of, of exactly where we're going to go, um, but that is that's on the table um, for us to consider. There's no more questions. Looks like we've got all the collateral issues solved. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I will end on one is I do think that um, we provided a working group letter on LIHTC loan collateral and all the other things, but I do think goals for certain types of collateral so the system can keep track would be very beneficial. Um, I think one, just understanding how the system is support, supporting collateral, but also to help us keep track if things need to be adjusted if we're not meeting certain goals. So, so I, have, I have one more question from the Zoom. Um, how does, can someone speak to how having a more robust secondary market for these assets helps the loss, loss issue from the bank perspective? That's a question for Sean, I think. Yeah, so I, I wouldn't actually conflate those two issues. Um, the price discovery in the secondary market speaks to underlying value, right? And, and what we can discover and ascertain, and we can measure the volatility of the price uh, of those assets with more certainty. You know, I'm a free market economist. You know, I, the more data is always better data. Um, and 
the more certainty we can have around the observable price, uh, the better my assumptions get in understanding what I could liquidate this asset for um, in, in a stressed environment. So the more data, the better, that's great. Um, the credit loss piece is um, kind of, again, maybe more attuned towards general eligibility. Can we accept it or can we not? I think we have one more question. We have about five minutes left. Yep. Mark. Yep. Thank you. So great, great discussion. Learning a lot here. Um, I want to challenge the premise that liquidation is the right outcome, even in the infinitesimally small circumstance that there's a bankruptcy of a CDFI or another mission-based lender here. Um, just because this asset class, in addition to having extraordinary performance, um, is also backed by um, so many actors um, in the mission-based lending space who have an interest in um, doing the work to keep these loans serviced and performing over time. And um, uh, we've been doing some brainstorming about this concept that um, maybe there's an alternative that is better for the banks and also better for the CDFIs and other mission-based lenders um, that includes another lender taking over the advances and the servicing of that portfolio in order to avoid a liquidation, in order to avoid this, you know, incredibly um, um, uh, deep additional haircut that's applied in these circumstances. And we've got a lot of uh, national and regional CDFIs that would be interested in servicing these kind of portfolios. It's part of their mission. HFAs would also be interested in servicing that kind of portfolio. I think it solves a lot of problems um, that are created here because of that assumption that um, a CDFI goes bankrupt and um, you've got a, you know, a, a LIHTC portfolio that isn't performing and that you have to liquidate and there's no other option. It's a, a very fair point and the Chicago Bank is, is wildly open to challenging that premise of a liquidation scenario. I wanna lead the horse uh, on a few items but we're, we're, we're challenging that premise and we look forward to uh, engaging with the average FA on, on what we have planned there. Another question over there. Uh, Tia Patterson, so I wanna go back to your associate members and the, the amount of collateral that an associate member has to put up, it's basically a dollar for a dollar. So if I've gotta put up a dollar, why would I ever borrow a dollar? I mean, so as we're thinking through collateral, not just for your members, but your associate members who are state or local housing finance agencies, I'm asking this for the California Housing Finance Agency, but it makes it very difficult for mission-driven public lenders to ever utilize your product. And if you go back to what your core mission is, housing and community development, that's exactly what their core mission is, housing and community development. And so the ability to really think through how you're going to deal with an associate member who, as I think Mark said, is never gonna go bankrupt. Um, some serious thought needs to be given to that. Yeah, and so I would just say that, um, you know, I know we're talking mostly about non-depository CDFIs today, but obviously when we talk about mission-oriented organizations, that's a little bit of a wider net and, you know, housing associates would be um, in that bucket um, in the discussion for, you know, what, what else we can do um, in that space as well. We have time for one more. We got time for one more. Or two more. Two more. Hey, I'm uh, Damon Allen, uh, Community Investment Officer, Chief Marketing Officer at the Federal Home Loan Bank of Cincinnati. One thing I do want to say and reiterate what Michael said and what Sean said about the collateral issue, the banks have an appetite to be more accommodative, but we do have restrictions, and until those restrictions are dealt with, we're not going to step too far out of our comfort zone because there are ramifications, so we'll get findings, we get examined, et cetera. So I do want to reiterate that. We are trying to be accommodative. 
but there are some constraints on us. So I just yeah. want to make sure that perception that we're not accommodative or not willing to be isn't out there. So. Yeah, and we are we are looking to provide additional guidance to to give the federal home loan banks a little bit more clarity on expectations. Um, that is on the, the to do list. And I'll, and I'll, we're also happy to look at any proposals you might have, Damon. Yeah, right up front. Yeah, David Gowans. Um, just to kind of follow up on, on the comment from over there, and, you know, we're talking about mission-oriented collateral, and you've got a great panel, but there's nobody up here that talks is talking about any of the indigenous populations, whether it's, it's Hawaii, whether it's Alaska, whether it's, you know, Native American tribes, and dealing on tribal lands. You know, that, that's collateral that can't be pledged into the systems. And like she was saying back there, we, we can't get benefit from, and we are members, we can't, you know, we can't get benefit from a lot of the programs because of that issue. And I'm not saying there's a quick fix, but I'm saying it needs to be addressed, it needs to be a part of this conversation and not just overlooked. Yeah, and I would say we can definitely add that at, towards the top of our list of um, yeah of collateral issues to look at. And uh, one more piece on that, just so everyone's aware, we are having a, another meeting tomorrow uh, that the federal, a lot of the members of the federal home banks will also be participating in that touch on some of those topics. So we're actually are working on some of those things as well. So thank you. And I just want to put in a plug for the fourth, the, the request for input that we're going to put out. Um, we want as much information or detail about, say, these specific types of collateral issues um, so that we can really focus our work on the things that will make the largest impact. Uh, and Cindy, you want to? I just want to say one more thing about that, because I think it's important. We do do lending to native um, CDFIs and on, on native lands. We pledge other kinds of collateral for that, OK? Now, another thing to think about is whether or not some of the other members, because we've got, we don't have unlimited collateral either, but some of the bigger members in the federal home loan bank system that do have collateral could pledge um, some of that with us making loans could be uh, a way to solve your problem. So we should talk more about that. Can we give our panelists another round of applause? Thank you so much for sharing your insights on mission-oriented collateral. And thank you all for your questions. Um, they definitely, and your comments, they definitely engage the, the dialogue and the conversation. At this time, we're going to take um, another break, our afternoon break, um, and we will reconvene at 2.45. So you have about 14 minutes. If you could please take your seats. You all can come on up. And welcome back. It is now time to um, be engaged in our last panel of the day about innovation and new opportunities. So without further ado, I will allow the panel to introduce themselves. Great. Um, well, um, this has been a great day thus far. I've learned a lot, have lots of notes. I think you all have some really great ideas about the path forward and ahead. So um, this panel is going to really spend some time talking about innovation, partnership, new opportunities, but really wanting to be mindful of the go forward and the act of what we need to do as a collective, whether it be the banks, the CDFIs, and yes, FHFA as well. So we'll spend some time talking through that. Um, and I'm really fortunate to have uh, Katie and Mike, Greg and Chuck here to talk with us about that. And so um, really, I think we've kind of discussed this at length that, you know, CDFIs really have the potential for impact within the system. 
you know, regarding affordable housing and community investment. But the opportunities to leverage the nimbleness of the CDFIs is something that we need to be much more mindful of and think through a bit more. So um, we'll spend some time talking about that, but wanted to kind of dig a little deeper, really talking about the partnership aspect of it first before we start talking about other pieces. So how are the banks and CDFIs currently partnering to support affordable housing and community investment? I'll turn it to you, Katie, to kind of talk through a little bit with that, if you don't mind. Sure, and I think the phrasing of that question is the key. Sometimes we talk about how are the banks supporting CDFIs and that when we start drilling down into these specifics and I think we lose sight of the broader why, we're really trying to partner to support communities. Yes. Um, so I think your question in a way is the answer. Mm -hmm. um, in Chicago, we have a number of uh, programs that are uniquely uh, sort of tailored to supporting to, to supporting CDFIs to achieve those community impacts that we're uh, sort of mission aligned on. One is our community first one. We've talked, um, Sean talked about that on the last panel. It's a, a revolving loan fund that um, support CDFIs. Um, we have another new product coming out shortly, but uh, that, that will support CDFIs through an advance, which we can talk about later. But um, yeah, I, I think, in a, you know, this topic of our panels, innovation. Yeah. And there's ways we can innovate within our regulatory programs. We've done quite a bit of that across the system, but um, the voluntary programs are where we have a real opportunity to innovate um, and to think differently about how we can partner with CDFIs to achieve those impacts that we're all after. Mike, do you want Yeah, to I'd just like to add on there. Thank you, Katie. Um, the, as for, uh, for being innovative, the Community First Fund really is important to our organization. Um, I um, represent Community Investment Corporation, and we're a um, mission-based CDFI that does affordable, or I'm sorry, affordable rental housing um, in Chicago. And you know, the Community First program really helps with our clients who can't take advantage of the AHP program due to the heavy um, compliance reporting on it. Um, our clients are locally, uh, local small business owners, 60% uh, uh, minority owned, 20% women. Um, and they just don't have the resources for the type of uh, reporting they would have to do for the AHP. So the Community First really is an innovative program for us uh, to use towards our clients uh, for lending. Um, and in the last two years, we actually renewed the CFF um, in 2022. And since that time, we've already created or preserved 2,000 affordable housing units through the, through the program. So it's a great program to, that we were able to leverage. So based on the uh, previous panels, it seems like you've heard of Canopy. Yeah, words out. Um, anybody know what it stands for? All right, we got one. <laughs> he's, he's cheating. All right, so this is, this is maybe the longest acronym name for a program ever, but I, I need to share it with you. And I have trouble remembering it, so that's why I'm reading it. Canopy stands for Community Advancement Through New Opportunities and Partnerships Yielding Results. There'll be a test afterwards to see who gets yes. that. Yes. Um, but Canopy is our um, pilot, our uh, loan fund dedicated for non-depository CDFI members of the Dallas Bank. We just launched this less than 60 days ago. Um, the Dallas Bank this year is, is taken a, a focus on our, our voluntary programs towards the CDFI side of, of the ledger. Um, we've got some interesting um, characteristics to our district. So from um, this is one of those, those cases where our district is like top of the bottom. Um, when you look at per capita income, I'm going to pick on your state. Go ahead. <laughs> Mississippi is 50th in the lowest level of cap per capita income. Uh, three of our other five states are in the 40s. Dallas is below average, or Dallas, Texas is below average. So we're not even average in terms of per capita income. So we're we're near the lower end of the spectrum. We've got an incredible diversity geographically in terms of things that happen to us in terms of climate and natural disasters, hurricanes, floods, fires, tornadoes. Um, on top of that, we've got a very um, diverse populace 
and that's there's diversity in education, there's diversity in, in ethnicity, and you tie that all into income, and we started looking at who can help us reach more of those folks throughout our district, and the answer is CDFIs. So thus, we, we focused a number of our, our priorities for pilots um, this year in, in that capacity. So um, it's not that there aren't other needs. There are. Um, but it, you know, we, we've had to take time to listen to the folks in our district, our members, and to understand where we can make a difference now. And I, I do want to shout out to the FHFA on the pilot framework. Um, that has been a game changer for us. Um, it's allowed us to, to experiment with some things that heretofore we wouldn't be able to have experimented with. And I, I have to agree with a comment that was made earlier. It, it is an opportunity for us to learn and figure out what works and what won't. So appreciate that. Yeah, and I think the key term here is listen. In order to listen, you got to communicate. Yeah. And the the working group that Joe Neary had been working on for three quarters of his life, and I wish I was that. yes, <laughs> and and Nick Mitchell Bennett, who may have skirted the area already, um, they they spent a lot of time on this. And HPN, uh, Shannon Ross is back there. They've been bringing all of this together so we could. Uh, put forth uh, our thoughts and our uh, ideas for improvement. And we, we did a great forum in Chicago in 2020 before the world took a pause. And we came up with a lot of great ideas. And that, and that forum was attended by, I believe, all the banks. Uh, I think Director Thompson was there, if, if I remember right. And um, we came out of there with a whole laundry list of things that we wanted to address. And, we thought, boom, we could put these things uh, in, in, in the works right away. Well, COVID had a different uh, uh, idea, so we had to take a pause on that. So we came back together uh, through a lot of encouragement by Joe uh, to, hey, the banks want us to do something on this. So let's start putting our ideas in process and let's figure out how we can narrow these things down to really what we want to do. In the meantime, the, the listening sessions and the F, uh, FHLB 100 a tour across the US was happening. And they heard a lot of the same things that we were talking about. Again, listening. They were hearing what we really wanted. Uh, so after that, while they're in the midst of preparing their report, they, and, invited uh, the working group members to come in for a private session to talk about what was happening great and what was needed, what needed to be changed at, at the, you know, in the system. We initially went in there with saying we were not going to be negative, we were going to be positive, and that changed 30 seconds into it when the FHFA says, we want to hear everything up good and we wanna hear everything bad. So let's not sugarcoat it. For our group, that you don't have to worry about that. Uh, if there's an issue, it, it comes up pretty quickly. So we had that meeting shortly thereafter. I went to Dallas for our annual conference. And I met with Sanjay and they had already heard some of the things that we had talked about and the report came out uh, and then right before the report came out, Sanjay and his team gathered the, uh, the CDFIs, the non-depository CDFIs in Dallas for a meeting uh, to talk about what they were planning to do. This was before, before the report came out. I'm sure they had heard some of the things. But they were telling us what they were going to do. And that was great. We didn't have to sit there and beg, borrow, and steal and say, hey, we, we'll do this if you'll do this. No, this is what we're going to do and when we're going to do it. That was great. And a lot of the things that have come out on the pilot program since that point in time 
it's exactly the way they said it was going to happen. So that's great. But it's all part of listening. And that's how you get through innovation. I mean, if there were, uh, you know, if we had the same opportunity to do this with the CDFI fund, that would be great that they could actually listen to what the CDFIs are experiencing and the lack of transparency that we're getting with, with the fund. So I guess we're going to have to work with the system first and then we'll, we'll head to the CDFI fund or the CDFI fund next. But again, I think a lot of these things are great. Uh, it's, they're long in happening. And so I think, you know, the sooner we can put these things in place, the better off we're all going to be. And if I can just follow up on the meeting we held uh, about 10 months ago, I guess it was, uh, with our CDFI members, uh, um, we did, Chuck said we, we told them what we were going to do. We, we actually, we presented some ideas. Yeah. Yeah, we told them what we thought we would do. We asked. We asked for feedback. Yeah. You know, do you like this? Um, so it was. It, it's exactly what you said, though. It was a listening, and it was a back and forth between all of our organizations. So it was, it was really productive, and it, it helped inform things that we're doing in in our pilot programs this year. Yeah, and I will add to that. Um, prior to Canopy being announced. We had a, a call with Sanjay and Greg and Kalyan and Nick and, and I um, to talk about how can we better understand, because they were looking at, you know, do we want to do a loan fund? Do we want to do an EQ2 product? What's the difference between the two? Which would you prefer? What are the terms you would like to see? This is, you know, what we're kind of thinking, but how does that work? Again, listening. They really wanted to hear what we wanted and, and, and if it would benefit us, as opposed to just saying, here it is, deal with it one way or the other. So, I mean, it, that was good. I mean, it was very appreciative that we had that opportunity to participate. And, and I would like to echo that, too, with the Chicago Bank. I mean, we're constantly in contact with the Chicago Bank. And what's nice about it is they're always asking us, what is the gap? Where are the boots on the ground? What do we see? What products do we need? And how can they help? And like you said, like everybody's saying up here, communication's key. Yeah. And we need to leverage that along you know, the, whole system, uh, the, the FHL bank system wide. Really understand what CDFIs need, what mission-driven organizations need in the communities. You stole my question, because really <laughs> my, my question to you, to you and to Mike really was, excuse me, you and Chuck, was really you know, what charge or what action um, would you give um, to those banks that maybe don't have programs? Um, that directly support CDFIs like Chicago and Dallas? Like, what's the action? What's the next step? What should they be doing at this point? And then also, what should FHFA be doing in that space as well? Yeah, so I'll just add one more. Um, in addition to how FHLB can provide programs and products for, for us, the other thing is to share their resources with us, such as, you know, putting us in contact with some of their other members. Um, we have a diverse set of... Um, Funders, most of our funders are commercial banks, FHL Bank, FH, FHLB Bank, but it would be nice to tap into other resources such as insurance companies or credit unions. Um, spread the word uh, who we are, use that resources, leverage off of that. Um, and I think one of the questions came up about, you know, we're talking about CDFIs, um, how there's, there's no losses with CDFI lending. Um, you know, we have strong balance sheets, and I was just looking back from when we first started taking advances in 2017, we've borrowed over $264 million through the advance window and paid back over $240 million. So, you know, we're, we're very credit reputable. Yeah, we're not that aggressive at the advance, advance window. We've borrowed 14, 15 million, somewhere around there. Uh, we had about uh, five, almost six million outstanding. Um, we got uh, 14 million of uh, first mortgage loans on deposit. And in one of their pilot programs that uh, came out was this haircut reduction from ours was 40% down to 12% if the borrower at the time of the, uh, the loan started was a 115% uh, or below. Fortunately, uh, I think around 80% of ours that we had pledged were 
in that category. And so our, uh, our advanced uh, line of credit went up about two and a half million dollars. So we've got uh, about six million of capacity to draw if we need to. Um, so again, that's great. Um, if we, as Cindy mentioned earlier in the last panel, if we could figure out a way to uh, work through the uh, nuances of the AMA program to figure out how CDFIs could get quicker liquidity, uh, that would be something that uh, would be uh, of interest. Uh, but I don't believe any CDFIs have participated in that program to date. I could be wrong, but I don't believe they have. Um, so that would be something that would be uh, helpful. To the other banks that are looking for things to do to address the pilot programs or uh, some of the things that are in the report and waiting for encouragement from FHFA, uh, I would just take a chance, see what works with the CDFIs, talk to them, hear what they want to do. Uh, as you've seen from most of the other panels, um, there's a lot of expertise in this room. Uh, there, people know what they're doing. Uh, they've been doing it for a long time. Uh, we are very patient lenders. We work day and night with borrowers to make sure that they pay us back because unlike banks, if they don't pay us back, we don't have a, a fallback. There's nobody providing us with millions of dollars of deposits to keep us going. You, that's how we get the next loan out the door in a lot of cases is somebody pays us back. So we're very flexible in, with our borrowers and working through plans to get them on track because I hear it all the time, you know, I, my car's not running, I can't make my payment. What can I do? Well, we'll work with you. I mean, so that's, that's one of the beauties of CDFIs is we're flexible and we're understanding. And, and, but we, we are as conscious of risk as banks are because we don't want to suffer losses and in most cases our losses are very minuscule. And so that's good. I mean, so we've had a lot of history in doing this. We got a lot of expertise that we can share and be uh, a part of. And I think we're gonna talk about that in a little bit of, you know, being a, a partner to the bank system. Well, since you said that, we'll go ahead and pivot now. Great. So I wanted to kind of pivot a little bit and talk a bit more about, you know, this idea of risk versus impact um, and its effect on creativity and innovation within the federal home loan bank system. And Greg and Katie, I just maybe could you all kind of talk about um, what the banks are doing to address um, mission and safety and soundness. We all know that they are not opposing ideas, but as we've heard today, there's real opportunity here. So wanted to kind of hear from you all, how you all have kind of thought and considered that in your engagement with CDFIs. Um, it is a, a balance and approaching a balance of what impact and risk mean to us and to CDFIs and all our members. Um, really looking at, at where the opportunity is and the, the good thing about pilots in particular is it gives us the opportunity to learn and to, to make adjustments um, as we go. Um, you know, the AHP is very, very structured and very rigid. Pilot programs, we can massage and, and work with. Um, but it's really, it gets back to understanding what our mutual objectives are um, and working in an environment where, um, you know, the, the, we're looking at things where safety and soundness is informed by achieving the mission without safety and soundness being the sole mission. And, and that takes, takes a little different path of, of thought. Yeah, and I'd say too, 
I, I think we've arrived as a system at a point of reflection. Um, I think back to the 2020 CDFI forum that we held in Chicago where many of our CDFI members and, and the banks came together to talk about CDFIs. We were in an educational mode. You know, here's who we are, here's who you are, let's learn. We are not having that conversation today. So even all. though there's work to be done, we are on this journey that, and I think we are making progress. I think we'd like to see the pace of that pick up um, now that the working group has sort of re-engaged post-pandemic and the banks have re-engaged. And um, so there's work to be done, but I think in terms of risk and impact, we need to reflect on what we've learned since CD5s became members of the bank. We're going on I, uh, 15 years at this point, I think. Um, we've learned a thing or two in that time. We've learned a thing or two in Chicago through our Community First Fund. That was a gateway to membership actually for a number of the partners that came on. Um, membership is not a requirement for that program but many of those partners became members because we, got, we came to understand CDFIs better through that program, which was not a regulatory program. Um, so I think we're at a point of reflection where we can look at what, what we offer and maybe where the gaps are and also existing programs and what those parameters are. Are there things that we put in place initially that maybe um, are not necessary anymore, or maybe we could pivot or loosen or expand access to programs because we know more now. And I, I think um, that's part of our maturing as a system and our understanding. And I think it speaks to um, the, the knowledge we've gained about the risk. And um, we know more and I think we can do more. So if I can follow a little more on this. So while our two banks have, have been focused in you know, Chicago a lot longer, but you know, we're we're focused on the needs of CDFI members. Other banks in the system are doing innovative things as well, and that, that shouldn't be lost in this conversation. So there, there are banks pursuing and, and have already launched special purpose credit programs. We've got banks that are doing tremendous things with native housing. So different, there are different needs throughout our footprint and different ways of solving problems, and we're, we're active in a lot of different ways, you know. So just, I guess the ask here is be patient as we all get around to different things um, and address different things. We, it's difficult to do everything all at once. It really is. I'll also add the community investment officers. So Greg and I are each the community investment officers at, at Dallas and Chicago. Um, there are 11 of us throughout the system. We, we convene monthly to talk about what we're doing, what we're working on, what's coming on the pipe. And, and so that idea that Mary Beth mentioned earlier, our colleague from Ind Indianapolis Bank, um, replication, yeah. we are able to be much more intentional about that now, I think, right. because we're having this conversation so regularly. And it's not just replicating what folks are doing. I look at Dallas and I and I think, gosh, you've stood up a lot of new stuff this year. The first part of this year, you stood up multiple pilots and uh, about a month and a half ago, reached out to Greg's team and said, how'd you do that? Because it's not replicating just the what, it's the speed, right? Um, right. Chuck, you mentioned not, not having this take forever. Um, we can replicate that too. There's things we can learn from one another um, to try to, to put things in motion where maybe there's a will and we just don't know the way. Um, there's a lot of structure and complexity through th even things like the pilot framework that, that, there, that adds a layer of complexity that we have to then kind of figure out how to work through. And if we have um, fellow banks that are doing that, we can learn from them and m hopefully move more quickly. I wanted to turn it to Mike and Chuck, any other ideas or thoughts you have in this space as well? Yeah, I just want to add, you know, it, it's great that, you know, Chicago and Dallas, I mean, they've, they've got these pilot programs and you had mentioned other banks are doing um, some stuff system-wide. Um, I think it's important as, um, as the FHL banks could have a little bit more um, opportunity to use voluntary funds uh, to create these pilot programs to keep in mind from the FHFA's perspective to not put any undue additional compliance on them to sort of allow them to be innovative and, and keep it flexible because one of the issues, you know, not issues, but one of the, well, major issue that, you know, we're dealing with right now is this, this high cost, um, high interest environment that we're in now. You know, five years ago, we had free money. You know, now uh, credit's getting tight and, um, you know, to have these innovative programs to where we could pass those, those cost savings off to our, to our borrowers is great. 
you know, our clients at uh, Community Investment Corporation, you know, they're, our lending is unsubsidized, so they're based, our clients, you know, we do naturally occurring affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And to have innovative programs that allow us to keep doing that and bring those savings brings more capital in, into the community. So I would encourage uh, um, the banks to do more um, as far as um, you know, some pilot programs, but not have that burden of, of additional uh, compliance with that. Yeah, I think there are more impact opportunities as well. Um, I know that there is a reluctance to uh, add a minority component to some of the uh, impact uh, reporting or allowed uses which I think is a miss. Uh, the, the key uh, topic that keeps going around is attacking racial wealth gap. Well, you can't address racial wealth gap until you put or deploy more products and services to minorities. And the CDFI fund has allowed that to be acceptable as part of our target market, and we, we changed our target market in 2018 from uh, uh, an encouragement from our board saying you need to do more to minority groups. And Mississippi, it, it, you know, it, yes, we are the low income state in the union. We're also the highest percentage of black population in the US outside of Washington, D.C. So, naturally doing stuff with minorities makes sense. But having that not included in the impacts that uh, the FHLBs can uh, report uh, doesn't make any sense. The other thing is uh, with the recertification changes that are coming out, and I, I know we're not talking about recertifications, but those, those recertifications are allowing uh, CDFIs to expand across borders, which means your, the CDFIs are now going to be working in areas outside of their district footprints if they're in a federal home loan bank uh, member. Uh, for example, we just moved into, or we just expanded into Alabama in 2023, which is in the Atlanta bank and not Dallas, and CDFIs cannot be a member of two different FHLBs. So any services that we provide to Alabama uh, cannot be supported by FHLB grants, which doesn't make any sense to me. It, to me, it should be, if you're providing the grant to the member, they should be able to provide those services to wherever they uh, provide in, or then within their target market, and the FHLB should get credit for that. So that's just you know another idea that would be helpful if we could do, because expansion now that the borders have, are going to be removed, is you're gonna see it all over the place. That's helpful, this is some good ideas and good thoughts here. Um, I want to kind of jump back again. We've talked about what the banks could be doing. You all have kind of hinted at what maybe FHFA should be doing as well. I wanted to kind of dive a little deeper into that because, again, this is a place where all of us need to be engaged in moving forward when it comes to innovation and partnerships. So are there other things that the agency needs to be doing in this space as well outside of the framework that we provided? Are there some other ideas or thoughts that you all might have? I don't know if this is FHFA. FHFA or FHLB, yeah, there's so many uh, terms here, uh, but if we could get CDFIs as a seat at the table uh, of leadership in the banks to hear what our thoughts are and how we can better craft programs for our members, that would be very helpful. Uh, we just Yes, we probably can go through the, and Greg and I had this conversation last week, yep. uh, trying to get voted in, but CDFIs are such a 
small percent of the members, it's, it's highly unlikely that we'd ever get voted in. So, and you know, if we could get a seat at the table without getting punished and not participating in programs, that would be helpful. You would get the ability to um, achieve, I believe the report has it as centers of excellence. There's a whole lot of excellence in this room. So the more that, you, that we can get the communication between the banks and the CDFI members, I think the better off we're all gonna be. Yeah, so since we talked about this, I'll jump in. Um, yeah, we convene groups and advisory groups all the time. And so, you know, we got you all together last year. Um, we desire to do that again. We recently had a meeting of our state uh, and regional HFAs that we hosted at the bank. We've got an insurance advisory council. Uh, we've got a, a credit union advisory council. So we, we've set up these different groups to give us insights that are very specific. Um, it's not a board seat. It's not the Affordable Housing Advisory Council. But in conveying ideas to us, extremely effective. Um, and so, you know, we, we want to continue to build on our conversations. Um, I know that, I know you're specifically interested in the AHAC. There's, I think that's an FHFA type ask of how that's managed. But, um, you know, I think, I think our dialogue's really generally good. When you talk about the AHAC, talk a little bit more specifically make, making some regulatory changes to who could be seated there or? Right. Okay. So, I mean, mm -hmm. right now, basically, members can't be on the advisory council mm -hmm. because they have an opportunity to be on the board, Correct. right, in terms of governance. Correct. Mm -hmm. So Chuck asked for a seat. That's all I'm conveying is yes. if there's going to be a change in that, that that's got to come from not us. Understood. <laughs> Understood. Chuck rarely has a shortage of asks. Like <laughs> Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in terms of what, what the FHFA could do to support innovation. Yes. Innovation requires focus. It requires us to be intentional and a lot of listening, right, to make that effective. Um, I think we need kind of the space and grace to innovate as banks. Uh, the pilot framework helps to provide that, mm -hmm. right? It provided some structure around um, what's needed to stand up something new. There's um, the Targeted Community Lending Plan, for those who aren't familiar. It's an annual plan the banks produce that documents the uh, most urgent district needs in this space. Um, and then anything we do in terms of new initiatives needs to point back to that plan for that next year. Um, we have to have documented the need uh, before we stand something up. And there's, and there's some new... Um, expanded guidance that will be coming around what needs to be in that. So that's helpful in many respects to help us draw clean lines. The, that type of thing also adds layers of complexity. There's a number of new plans um, that sort of hit the banks in the community investment space that will just take some bandwidth from the subject matter experts that we also need to be driving innovation. Um, so there's not a way to just expand staff to do it. You need people that can have that subject matter expertise working on all these mm -hmm. things. So I think as the FHFA um, rolls out some of these new supports, many of them are supports, they're intended to help. Um, mindfulness of the demands that that will place on the folks who are needed to innovate would be very helpful. My God. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I mean, and Chuck, you said it before too. I mean, we met, you know, 2020 in Chicago, you know, we had these conversations, we're having, you know, the symposium today. And I think it's great that the FHFA is interested in listening to, to the issues, you know, around collateral, around pilot programs, uh, new capital. Um, but now we need to have action. And I think Agreed. that's the main thing is to have action. Agreed. Agreed. Well, with that, are there any questions? We'll go ahead and start taking some questions from the audience and then our, in the virtual space as well, if we have any. Uh, just to want to address to the gentleman's uh, comment about getting on the board as a CDFI. I'm 0 for 13 in elections, but I'm looking forward to 14th year to run from San Francisco and get on the board. I'm still optimistic. Um, 
does the FHFA have the authority to designate a seat for CDFI members, or is that something that would have to come from Congress? No, we do not. Yes. But okay, thank you. Should you? Yeah. I thought I heard another response. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Please. Um, Agnes Hardison, Homeland Bank of Chicago. I wonder if Greg and Katie, you could just talk for a moment. We've talked a little bit about the unsecured funds, the haircut uh, reduction initiatives, but there are a lot of other innovative things that the home loan banks are doing, and, and some of them are, are also beneficial to CDFIs, and I wonder if you could just touch on those for just a moment. Since I think I, I might know one thing that um, you're thinking of, I will kick this off from Chicago. We are launching a, a pilot program shortly. It's a discounted advanced product that um, will meet needs that we cannot currently meet on the lending side through SICA and CIP. Um, those are the our community advanced products that provide sort of the, a, a modest discount. This will be a more deeply discounted advance for certain types of community lending that are somewhat outside of the, the regulations, um, what, what they would allow. And it supports CDFIs really in two ways. It's really exciting. Uh, so I'm glad that you teed this up. So, it, for our CDFI members who want to use that product, they can support the community lending they're doing, get a deeper discount to really facilitate, and, and we can amplify their impact in their, in their work. Um, so they can be users of this product. Other members can also lend to them um, as recipients. So that, that one potential use for this advance is for um, members to lend to CDFIs and then receive a discounted uh, sort of pricing in recognition of that. So they, CDFIs can be the beneficiaries in, in sort of two ways on this product. Uh, and that's something that we had not been able to achieve through the regulatory program, but we're gonna be able to do through this. So uh, that was a result of a lot of listening. We did um, a host of call uh, member calls, including with many of our CDFI members to understand where the regulatory program was sort of falling short uh, and where we could add more impact for them. Yeah, so uh, thank you for the question. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention, too, that the um, Federal Home Loan Bank of Boston is developing and, and I think soon to announce a discounted advance dedicated to their CDFI members. I don't know all the details, but I was given the green light to share that. So there, there is another, another bank coming up with another CDFI-specific program. Um, in terms of the Dallas Bank, We've got a number of things that we've done in the last year, and, and, and before that, uh, we stood up a, a small business program that fills the gap for on small business lending that we learned from Pittsburgh. It's uh, you know we we borrowed a lot of elements from the Pittsburgh Bob offering. We borrowed a lot from Community First Fund to set up Canopy, so that the the sharing that. Katie mentioned earlier, does happen, um, and, and it, it flows really well. Um, to that end, Renaissance, Chuck's CDFI, uses the Small Business Boost Program exceptionally at a, an exceptionally high level. I mean, they're typically one of the top three users of this program every year. Um, well over 50 small businesses have been helped over the last three plus years. So um, that's one innovation, one benefit to membership. Um, last year, we also created um, a program that addresses heirs' property rights issues and helping communities resolve those issues. Um, it's a real big deal in the Mississippi Delta, a lot of urban areas, a lot of rural areas, I mean, most of our district, um, where titles of homes, businesses, land are not clean, can't be used for any kind of collateral, can't be borrowed against, it's a problem. Um, we've also created a program called our Fortified Fund, and that's one that addresses the issues around wind storms specifically, tornadoes, hurricanes. And if you don't know, Fortified Constructions of scientifically developed type of building 
that has been proven to withstand Cat 3 hurricanes and EF2 tornadoes. So it's not 100% foolproof, but it's really, really good. Um, and so we've got a program that will help people re-roof their homes um, with this fortified standard. Because I think you all know, if you can get back into a community and get back into your home sooner, that the faster the community can recover. So that was a priority of ours last year, and, and we've committed close to $6 million between last year and this year to, to replace roofs in our district um, with that program. It's been really well received. Um, shifting gears back to the CDFI piece, um, aside from Canopy, we've got the um, Community Building and Growth Grant, which is a, a capacity building program um, we're in the process of, of receiving final applications from CDFIs, both members and non-members right now. Um, those are due at the end of the month. Um, but those will provide grants up to a half a million dollars for members, up to uh, $100,000 for non-members. And it is, it is what it says. We're providing grants so that you can do more of what you're doing. Um, and help you help the CDFIs grow. Um, we opened it up to non-members. We purposely made the benefit for members higher, and that was very effective coupled with the Canopy announcement to actually increase our CDFI membership. So we've got two brand new CDFI members. Uh, it's my understanding we might get a third here pretty soon. Um, and you know that the, there's benefits all the way across the board. Uh, for these things, so um, it's it's been a great year for us um, to do a lot of different and, and unique, unique things. But they're all things that can help benefit not only CDFIs but all of our membership. Yeah, just to reiterate um, what Greg is saying, the the small business boost program that he's talking about, uh, we lent out over two million dollars to. 50, I don't know, 52 businesses or something of that nature. And it, it's a great program. It's a mezzanine uh, program. It's non-recourse to the CDFI. Uh, if the borrower has an issue uh, down the road, it, it becomes a grant to the borrower. So we're not responsible for paying back. But it, it's, it's a great uh, additional capital source for our borrowers uh, to continue with their business. And, you know, the the capacity grant that uh, Greg just mentioned, it, it allowed us to come up with some innovative new programs, hence the, the title we're here, Innovation, uh, that uh, to serve our borrowers. One is a an emergency capital fund for our small business borrowers to prevent them from heading to the payday window which is very prevalent in Mississippi. We've had some borrowers, businesses negatively impacted because they were suffering a cash flow crisis and they went and took down a lot of these advances, uh, which were, as, as you know, they're very expensive. I think the average in Mississippi is 600% uh, or something. If Nick was here, he would have all the statistics because he's the, he's the leader in these uh, small business or these small money fund loans. But so we did that. We were creating our, our first uh, consumer loan uh, to help out with uh, borrow or housing borrowers who are not able to address some issues that their insurance provider is is uh, telling them that they're not going to be renewed. So we're allowing them under this program, it's one of our ideas, that they can they can borrow from us on an unsecured basis to fix those, whether it be their uh, roof issues or have a tree removed or fix an air conditioner. I mean, it's this capital is very much needed, and I think our application was two times more than the uh, max that we were allowed, the 500,000, and, and we're gonna make it into revolving loan funds. So it's, that's what we do as CDFIs. We are innovative, we are creative, and we look for ways to keep our borrowers moving. I have one Please. thing. Please. Yeah. 
Last week, representatives from six of the banks represented the system at the OISTA um, Capital Access Convening outside of New Mexico, or, or Albuquerque in New Mexico. Um, we had a session about the system. It was a wonderful conference. Uh, one of the evenings, there was an awards event, and it was an innovation awards event. And one of the recipients, a staff member from one of the CDFIs that represented there, um, had to give her acceptance speech. And in her acceptance speech, she said something that really resonated, and I continue to think about multiple times a day. She, she said, this work isn't hard. Um, and, and then she proceeded to talk about why it's not hard. And, and the reason it struck me is because we were in the middle of some of these conversations around light tech collateral and things that sometimes feel challenging around innovation. And so I've been reflecting a lot on what makes it feel hard. And I think um, we come at these topics with our lenses and our perspectives, and there is intersection where there is an opportunity for solutions. And, and I think we're sort of limited by our own creativity. Mm -hmm. um, getting the right voices in the room so we can have the understanding to inform the solution. But I do think th there are intersections between the spaces we all work in where we can find those solutions. And when you get it, when you find those spaces uh, of where the solution will be, it is not hard. Um, it becomes obvious. And so I, I think we're still waiting for some of the light bulbs on some of the issues we're talking about. But um, I, I think that's that was my takeaway last week. And I'm carrying that spirit into the rest oh. of the year because I think that's how we're going to get things done is to um, get more in a problem solving mode. And, and sometimes we can feel stuck, but we, that's sort of our own choosing. I like that. Yeah. I really do. I like so that. Sharing for what that's worth. Um, it was powerful for those of us who were there. Mike, I want to pivot back to something you mentioned earlier. So the AHP is very near and dear to me. So many of those here know that. I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, you mentioned um, the regulatory frustrations that many CDFIs have with the affordable housing program. Since we're talking about innovation and new opportunities, I know this is very much on the spot, but wanted to kind of talk to you a little bit about what do you see to be more innovative in that somewhat prescriptive space as you've identified it and said that it's little limiting, what could be done there in that space to really support CDFIs more? Yeah, for us, I mean, it's it's similar to what we, we've been talking about, you know, the CFF fund, the Community First Fund, um, the new program that's coming out with the, um, the discounted um, interest on the advances, that helps us bring the capital to our, to our clients. Since our clients are unsubsidized, this is what they really need, um, and we can make that happen um, without the undue regulatory burden. Clients. Okay. Uh, understood. Please. I've got a uh, separate but related question yes. from the chat, um, specifically asking about the heirs property program at the Dallas Bank and whether the bank um, will be continuing this voluntary program. But then I'm, I'm going to ad lib with a broader question about how the banks think about voluntary programs and how do you consider kind of when to keep them going and when to sunset them and think about new things. So to go in reverse. Dallas loves voluntary programs, um, and I think, you know, it, it's it's allowed us to do the things that I just talked about, um, and to do more of it. Um, you know, the, the commitment the system made to do an additional five percent of of our funding into community investment programs this year, as it coupled with the the pilot framework, has just helped us spawn so many new ideas and do new things and, and add to things that are already successful. Um, so I, I'm a big fan. I would much prefer, and this is Greg Hetrick's personal opinion, um, doing more and continuing with the voluntary piece rather than a full ad of it all goes to AHP no matter what. I, I, I think that that's, that limits what we can do. I, I like to have flexibility, I like options, I like to be able to do really interesting, impactful work. So that's that's me. Um, Airs property program, yes, we are carrying it on this year. We've got $2 million. Uh, we've doubled the commitment from last year. It was very well received last year. Um, and we'll open it up in, uh, I think it's late August, or I'm blanking on the date exactly, but August. So. FHLB.com for more information. Related to voluntary programs, uh, you asked about the approach we take. How do we d determine what to pursue and so forth? 
every year we do a needs assessment that we document in our targeted community lending plans. And so that process to inform that document um, identify some of the most critical needs. Um, we then talk with our advisory councils and other stakeholders and partners and members to determine kind of where to hone in. In Chicago, we identified three areas of um, acute need back in 2021 and launched three new voluntary programs in 2022, a diverse developer initiative to support uh, diversity in the affordable housing industry, support for housing counseling agencies, and then small business grants. We committed to three years at that point because we saw this was not a short-term need um, we wanted to get get familiar in those spaces um, and have some maturity uh, when that three years came up, which is now. Uh, we're in the third year, and we are now looking again. Are these the uh, of all the needs in the district? Where do these where do these lie? Are these things we're going to continue? What else has emerged since we last approved these? Um, so it's an iterative process over time um, where we go with that voluntary strategy. Um, but the the main driver is community needs, sort of gaps, unmet needs. And I'm gonna build on that with another question we received from online about the targeted community lending plans. Um, if y'all could talk a little bit more about steps the banks take to make sure the plans are implemented. Um, there's also a question about FHFA's oversight over the plans. And I'll add any steps CDFIs take, can take or do take to be involved in their development or implementation. So um, in terms of Dallas, our targeted community lending plan is informed from, um, you know, talking with our stakeholders, from our members to our AHAC, um, to uh, you know, a, a wide variety of folks. So we every four years we also do a deep dive research project. We call it our district needs assessment. Uh, we're currently wrapping that up right now. Um, and that helps inform our targeted community lending plan. So we, we mix a combination of census and statistical data and research along with um, surveys and, and interviews with our members, HP sponsors, AHAC, et cetera. A um, lot, of, lot of housing and small business stakeholders as well throughout our district. And so that helps inform what we're doing. In terms of accountability on the district needs assessment, we um, have goals within that, excuse me, it, not the needs assessment. In the target community lending plan, there are goals within that that we set annually. We report to our advisory council and our board on the results quarterly. Um, each target community lending plan has the results of last year's goal setting. Did we accomplish what we set out to do? And there's a, a written evaluation about what was working and did we meet the goals or not? And if we didn't, we, we take a look at why. Um, so. Yeah, the outreach strategy the banks each use, it differs by district. And it's partly just due to the structure of our system. Chicago has two states. So the kind of outreach we do to, to inform that plan might look a little bit different than Des Moines, for example, where they've got you know states and territories in the double digits. Um, so the way they collect their data in terms of the um, input piece might look a little bit different than what some other states or districts would do. Um, Right now, that is driven by the banks. Um, we each develop our own strategy for soliciting those inputs based on the nuances in our district. Um, do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, I can talk a little bit about FHFA's oversight. So we do not approve the plans, but we do post them. They are publicly available on our website, so we do post them. But we do actually read every plan. We do evaluate. We share our feedback on the policy side with, our, with the examiners. So when they do go out, if there is something in the plan that may be questionable for us or we have additional, we were wanting some additional insight on, we do share that feedback. So it is a very involved process as far as our review and evaluation, so. Yeah. Um, so these, these programs are all incredible and um, kudos to all of the banks that are leading into this space. So one other, so we often tend to focus innovation on the new um, and we focus it on products and services, right? So at risk of being a broken record. The other way to innovate is to think about challenging problems, haircutting on LIHTC, and new ways of coming at that, right? So just one more plug for the regulator 
to think about how they can innovate getting us all in a room to work on some of those challenges where we see the results, excessive haircuts. We all know that that's not right, and yet all of our processes take us to that, that's exactly right. So how do we innovate collectively where we've got three different parties with different perspectives here as a system? So I just want to make that encouragement to the regulator that innovation can come in process change as well. Noted. Noted very much. Yep. Any other questions? Well, I have my list of takeaways. I'm hearing impact, yes, beyond that, but definitely impact and flexibility. And of course, the listening piece is something that we're all doing, but I think one of the things that direct, um, Director Thompson charged us with, and Cindy brought it up during her remarks as well, though, is that it just can't be the conversation. There has to be action from this point. And Joe, to your point, I think you're very much going to see, this is just the first of many. And this is not a conversation, but really a directive for all of us on how we're going to move um, forward. So with that, thank you all. And I'm going to turn it over to Joshua Stallings to close us out. Yes, thank you all. Um, let me just say a few thank yous before we uh, get out of here, because I, I would say that if anyone wants to know my grand thoughts on all of these things, I think the director pretty much said it all this morning. I think that uh, me reiterating a lot of those points is probably not a, the, the best use of, of our time. time. I want to thank all of our, our panelists and speakers that we had today. I also want to thank uh, all those here at the FHFA who helped get this all set up and were coordinating this. Uh, the, those efforts uh, uh, were certainly uh, very useful. Um, I also want to uh, say thank you to everyone that's here. Uh, look, I mean, I think it's not it's not a small thing uh, to ask, you know, uh, CEOs, uh, board members uh, of, of the federal home banks, but also, uh, you know, the folks running the CDFIs to, to make time out of, their, out of their day, come across the country to all be here to talk about some of these things. Um, and, you know, and I think that a lot of these topics are things that we all have heard. Uh, you know, some level of detail on a few times, but I think that we're it's all slowly starting to sink in. Uh, you know, there's something about repetition that does that. Uh, so I would say that the uh, the biggest takeaway from from me right now for me right now is just to uh, to keep pressing on this. You know, from from the agency perspective, because I think that there are solutions here that can be found. Uh, I didn't hear a lot of things come up today that weren't on some level solvable, uh, you know? Now, will it be as 100% the solution that everyone wants? Maybe not, uh, but will we be able to find some solutions? I think so. Uh, and look, I would say that in uh, the history of, of these kind of topics, one of the biggest obstacles has been my role. <laughs> uh, you know, obviously, uh, supervision uh, of the federal home loan banks uh, is is a piece of of what has made uh, made the system uh, you know a, a risk averse system, uh, but I think it's also led to in some ways uh, a pro some processes uh, not even necessarily being risk averse, but not but just not not being as curious as it could be. And the beauty is that curiosity is actually in the system. Like you unleash it, you, we're seeing it now, right? A lot of the banks have those have these people in in, in place. Uh, they just weren't unleashed to really think these things through and try to get to the solutions. And so I think one of the the best things that I've really been seeing over the last few months is that the federal home banks have this. Uh, you know, if uh, we just have to continue to to nurture this and foster it. I think we're going to get to some good solutions. I think the federal home loan banks have the kind of personnel that, that want to find solutions here. Uh, and we'll continue to work with them to try to, to try to get to those ends. Now, um, I imagine it will be uneven for a while. Uh, you know, we're, we're trying some things out at, at one bank and, and, and not at another. Uh, maybe and we will see some of those practices kind of cross over the system over time. Uh, uh, but you know where we can uh, align practices, we we will push for some of that. 
because uh, I think that that is, is in particularly of interest to me in the collateral space and in some degree in the, in the member evaluation space to kind of make sure we're all kind of coming at this from a similar point of emphasis. So again, let me thank you all for being here. Uh, you know, I would say that, you know, we're, we're, we're not we're not done. Uh, everyone getting in the room is not an accomplishment. <laughs> it's, it, it is nice to see everybody, though. Um, and I would say that you know the I, I don't want the I don't want to to hear on these topics uh, that uh, you know that that the answer is the FHFA won't like that uh, because if the answer is the FHFA won't like that that. Um, then it probably means that we haven't really asked the FHFA enough about why they don't like it, right? Because if, if they can't tell you why, they don't know yet. Uh, so I would encourage uh, you know, the, the banks to continue to engage with us uh, and you know, the CDFIs continue to engage with your, with, with your bank. Uh, and we'll continue to try to uh, find some solutions on these topics. Uh, so look, I think that the, the CDFIs as a group with the last big cohort of potential members to, to gain access to the system. Um, it was a slow go <laughs> for all the other membership classes that joined too. Uh, but at some point there was a break point and, and we saw the, the benefits really start to, to flow to some of those other membership types. And I think that we'll see the same here. Uh, it, but you know, I think that, the, that we're, we're still kind of at the beginning phases of some of that. So, uh, please stay engaged with all of this. We have a lot coming down the pipe over the, the next, uh, next, uh, you know, years of years if you'll let me sit in this seat long enough. Uh, but certainly, um, I don't want anyone to think that we're that we're not working on things now. Uh, if you, uh, unfortunately, we are a government agency, so I can't share a lot of what we're thinking until we're done. Uh, but we are working on quite a bit. Uh, we were are hoping to have quite a bit out over the over the coming months and coming year. Uh, so again, thank you all. Stay engaged with your bank, with us, uh, and on these topics because they clearly are important. Uh, with that said, I can either let you guys all go or you guys can ask me a couple questions. It really depends on what you guys want to do. I think they want to go. Well, let's let that happen. Thank you all again. <laughs> <laughs>